Welcome to the committee of the whole meeting of the Cape Coral City Council. Today is May 31st, 2023. This meeting now comes to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Yes, Your Honor. Before I call the roll, I would like to announce that Council Member Long requested mm -hmm. to be excused and I will mark himself. Mayor Gunter? Here. Council Members Costin? Here. Cummings? Here. Hayden? Here. Shepard? Here. Sankey? Here. Welsh? Here. Seven present and one excused. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, item four is business, 4A is citizens' input. Citizens' input is a maximum of 60 minutes is set for the input of citizens on matters concerning city government. Three minutes per individual. Please remember to state your name if you're going to participate in citizens' input. And we're going to use the podium to my left, your right. So anyone who wishes to speak, please come forward. Go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead, you can go. You raise your hand first. Good morning, council members. Good morning, Mayor. My name is Carrie Lerner. I'm a graduate of Calusa Middle School, Cypress Lake High School, Edison Community College. And then I moved on elsewhere and I've come, I came home five years ago. And I am here to talk about the fate of the ballroom at the Cape Coral Yacht Club. The only historically significant architecture in the entire city. It was reported on NBC News 2 News this morning that the cost to destroy the ballroom is equivalent to the cost of repairs. It also has been reported that um, some of those repairs weren't, were in place due to lack of regular maintenance, lack of attention prior to the storm. <clears throat> As someone who calls Cape Coral my hometown, this is a significant, significant issue. Um, it's, it would be fiscally irresponsible just to tear down, just to tear down, a, in, in order to replace with what? Are we gonna have to come up with another bond issue? Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense. I plead with you to please consider saving the only historically significant structure in the entire city. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Bob Lawson, also addressing your planned uh, demolition of the Yacht Club. As background, for months, the city misled the public, still on, its, still on its website and at your January retreat, that because of extensive and significant damage caused by Hurricane Ian, the Yacht Club will need to be demolished. Those statements were untrue. Two different insurance estimates put the storm damage at about $25,000. And as of 1998, the building is a historic landmark, and the city has a preservation ordinance with procedures to follow before demolition, and it prohibits demolition by neglect. And FEMA has exceptions to the 50% rule for historic buildings. And 12 days ago, we sent a letter to the city manager asking if the city would follow its own preservation ordinance law. Uh, no response to that. We also asked about restoring some power to ventilate the building to prevent mold. Again, no response. So what about today's meeting? We see the city is presenting you with information about public-private partnerships, along with data indicating deferred maintenance of the building. Now the city seems to, seems to be saying, hey, we were just kidding. The building wasn't really damaged. Instead, we've been neglecting it for years, and we want to use that as an excuse to tear it down. You may be told the roof needs to be replaced, an expensive item, but it's my understanding it needed a replacement before the storm. Over a period of future years, the building can be incrementally repaired as necessary. 
Besides being iconic uh, mid-century architecture, it's the only community center for large meetings in the city. Organizations such as the Chamber of Commerce, New Residence Club, and the city itself are being harmed by unavailability of the building. Uh, I looked it up the other day. St. Petersburg, Florida, population 250,000, has 23 listings on the National Register of Historic Places. Can Cape Coral have one? Has the city investigated various federal grants which might be available to help renovate a historic building? Uh, really, you're going to replace Cape Coral's only historic landmark with restaurants and bars. Some of you have told us you're still looking at all the facts and haven't made up your mind uh, what to do. In the meantime, as stewards of the city's building, the most urgent question I have is whether you'll instruct the city to provide ventilation to the building for, to prevent uh, mold and, and further uh, neglect of the building. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mark Giordetti. Um, Mayor uh, Gunter, thank you for meeting with me yesterday and discussing some of the things I'm going to talk about right now. Um, we have visited Cape Coral for over 15 years. And in our plans for retirement, we decided on the Yacht Club area. Um, so we invested our life savings into two homes in the Yacht Club. Um, a lifetime of memories was created at that Yacht Club. And now, a lifetime of memories is being robbed because of the closure. I implore you to open the beach. I know that um, uh, there are plans, and I don't think anybody is against slight improvements or responsible improvements. But overwhelmingly, the community is against closure, especially when we talk in terms of years. Because for some of our citizens, do not have years. And this was a daily part of their routine. This was their life. Um, the Yacht Club wasn't broken before the storm. Now it's bent. So let's straighten it. I don't want to talk about what things have been wrong in the past. I don't want to talk about um, things that are be behind us. I want to talk about now and what we can do in the future. I, I again implore you to open the number one attraction uh, in all of Cape Coral. And as far as the ballroom's concerned, it has proved its resilience by standing through the worst storm the area has ever seen. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Morning, Mayor and Council, Joe Mazurkowitz. 55-year resident of the city of Cape Coral. I don't bring that up much, but I thought it was pertinent today. Obviously, I came here as an infant, but uh, <laughs> That was supposed to be funny. Only one of you got it, right? <laughs> I got it. All right. Brian got it. I want to talk about uh, a couple things on your agenda today. First of all, public-private partnership. Uh, I would not be hypocritical and say that I don't support public-private par partnerships because I brought the first one to the city of Cape Coral. And I think they're extremely important, and I think they're an amazing funding term, uh, tool because that's what they are. They're a funding tool that allows not only capital funding, but operation for a period of time. And I think that's a great way to make the improvements of the Yacht Club if you choose to do so. You just need to think about one thing. You have to change one word. From destroying the ballroom to refurbishing is with the public-private partnership. It's not, they're not mutually, uh, they are, uh, they're not mutually um, exclusive. You can do both. You can do a public-private partnership and still save the ballroom. You just have to write your RFP that way. Also, I'd like to just very quickly remind the city uh, and your interim city manager, I'm sure he's very much aware, but the Redfish Point HOA were promised a myriad of 
conditions when, in, when the Yacht Club was being uh, in, ready to uh, be improved. And the city did an amazing job in meeting the requirements and the needs of the adjoining owners. As you go forward with this project, make sure that the, the, uh, the buffers, the landscaping, the noise abatements, the light abatements are all included in your request for proposal for whatever you're going to, your plans or whatever they're going to be for the Yacht Club. And finally, the ballroom is, you know, people would say, well, it has no historic significance. And in many cities, it wouldn't. But in this city, it's the only building with historic significance. And I know when I sat up there, I was a much younger man, maybe not worried about history. Maybe I'm a lot more keen in thinking about historic things now because I'm beginning to be become one. But when you look forward and you want to do things, great things for this city, all I ask you to do is respect our past. And this is the only standing structure of any significance to this community going forward. If you take it away, it goes from one to none. There will be no ties to the beginning of this community. There will be no ties to the history. And you will have severed them completely with your decision to tear down that building. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning all, Gloria Tate, Cape Coral resident, 63 and a half years. So you all know why I'm here and I wondered if all of you got the article that I sent you uh, yesterday concerning the design and the historic value of the Cape Coral Ballroom. It came from the News Press Archives from 1961 and it describes, I'm not going to read it, but I am hoping that each one of you read the article and understand the joy that came from an architect who built this building and designed it. And everywhere in this article, it says it was built for the residents as a community resource. We now have nothing. And if we choose to hold a meeting and we have to go to the Westin, and I love the Westin, but it is not cost affordable for any of us. This is what the Yacht Club building was designed for. I know y'all are really sick of seeing me because I'm tired of coming here. I had retired for a reason. But this is the only thing that will get me out of my seat and into your face because I want to save the building, make no doubt. I also told you in the article and the email that I sent you that I've spoken to the state and our um, resolution that we passed in 1998 is strong and it stands and they will work with us to do historic preservation. It would be great if I had a council member and I believe I have one that would say Gloria will help you because I can do the application as an individual but it would be so much greater to have at least one, two, three, maybe all eight of you to sign on to do historic preservation for the Yacht Club. I've also talked to the Lee Trust for Preservation. They've earmarked the building to be saved. They will also come and help us restore this building. So please, before you use the word demolition, and I would suggest that you need to remove that from the news press, the news articles, the media, and your own vocabulary, and talk about refurbishment. Without history, we have nowhere to go. We don't remember how we got here. And Jack and Leonard Rosen put every ounce of creativity they had into building this city. And with one fell swoop and a bulldozer, you're gonna wipe it out. So please, consider saving the Yacht Club. By the way, I was at Fort Myers Beach Sunday. Their sand is beautiful. They have all brand new sand and they are open for business. I was in Sanibel. They're struggling more, but their beach is open. Bonita Beach is open. On and on the list goes, but Cape Coral Beach remains closed. Thank you for your time. I hope you will remember to save the Yacht Club Ballroom. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to one citizen's input? Yes. Come on up, sir. Good morning, Mayor, Council, Mr. L. Chisholm, Derek Frazier, District 5, 40 year resident of the city of Cape Coral. I retired from the city six years ago. Um, 
pertain to the Yacht Club, I have literally hundreds and hundreds of hours put into this structure. I'm not here to talk the numbers. I'm not here to talk whether it should or shouldn't be. I'm here to dispute the facts that I've heard from this report by the real estate company. I have a number of pictures I took fairly recently that I'd like to show the council. Um, I don't think you comprehend the construction of this building. This building is unique along with the Tony Rotino Center and the Four Freedoms Building. There are no other structures around built like these buildings. The beams are glue lambs, multiple layer two by eight glued together under pressure. Those beams alone in the main ballroom are gonna cost you a hundred grand a piece. Um, two by eight, two by six, southern yellow pine, glue lamb embedded in the concrete footings. Um, the roof's about 23 years old. It has been in need of repairs for years and years. There are a number of places that have been repaired up there. The material they use for this roof system is the roof covering, excuse me, not the roof system. The roof system is as sound as a rock. The roof covering showed very minimal or destruction. You gotta get that approved by the city clerk before you can show anything, sir. Let's start with one. <clears throat> and I'm not real good at that, so I'll let you handle that. This is the, uh, the west side. This is the Tony Retino side, and that is the beach end, the south end of the building. You see that the gable rake metal there would the council bear with me? I have a lot of information I'd like to give you. Sir, you only have the three minutes, but I'll give you a few extra minutes to show us the pictures, and then you could follow up with the email to any of us if you have some additional. Well, comments. then the pictures will be a moot point. Um, well, what this boils down to is a roof system is virtually unscathed other than the damage that I've been repairing since 2008. There's documentation underneath the tarp I can't believe you won't give me a few more minutes when you're trying to knock down one of the main buildings in the city of Cape Coral. Well, sir, if I, if I make an exception to you, I have to make it for everybody. Everybody else That's why I waited utilize the three minutes. This is the leak area that is tarped by the city of Cape Coral, and you see all the red dashes in the leak area. I've got about 30 patches over the laps. It's the mid-lap of the panels is electrolysis, but the roof covering is a moot point compared to the structure. The structure is three, five quarter, southern yellow pine, glue lamb, tongue grew together. They go across the main beams in there. The damage that Thank this you, was sustained is to the entranceway. The building itself has suffered no structural damage. To knock down this building would be knocking down Sir, a perfectly good structure. You're either going to have to abide structure. by the rules or leave. You pick. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak during citizens' input? Mm. See, a non-citizens' input is now closed. Is there any discussion by council on citizens' input? For me, I'll hold my comments to when we get to that uh, discussion in the agenda. Okay, let's move, move on to the uh, first item of business is uh, 4B1, uh, public-private
partnerships overview, Mr. City Manager. Good morning, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, this item was added to the agenda as an educational um, informational session. Uh, we're not seeking any um, guidance or consensus on this. It's purely uh, educational as we look towards uh, next year's budget and into our uh, near future, uh, the likelihood of having several P3s on the table um, is, is fairly certain. And so I have uh, this morning a presentation from uh, the law firm of uh, Bryant Miller and Olive, Mr. Fred Springer and Ken Arton. Uh, Fred has uh, previously helped uh, the city of Cape Coral with um, some P3s in the city, and so he's knowledgeable of, of our processes as well as uh, the laws. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Fred and Ken. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Council Members. I can see the, you can see it now too. Um, so thank you for having us. Before I get started, I, I just wanted to express our sympathy on the loss of um, City Attorney Menendez. So she was a, a big fixture in local government law community in Florida. So our, our sympathies are, are with you. Um, we wanted to talk about public-private partnerships generally. So we do have a presentation um, that we'll cover. We'll try and cover it from a, several different angles. If you do have questions, we'll just defer how, however you want to um, handle them. Um, so when we talk about pub from a lawyer's perspective, P P3s or public-private partnerships in Florida, we, we've had a law now, a statewide law on the, in Florida statutes for 10 years. So it was um, pushed by the development community uh, several attempts were made, three or four sessions, and it finally got through in 2013. Um, it's, it's, in my personal view, I, I think it's not, not well written and it's not well conceived. It was copied from uh, Virginia, which is not a home rule jurisdiction. Um, so it, it comes from a different context than we have in Florida, but we, we do have it on, on the books. There are not too many procurement laws apply across all governments in Florida. So the, when you buy architectural engineering services, that's one, and this is one. So many of the state procurement laws only apply to state agencies. This one applies to local governments, and including the, the cities. Um, oddly, it does not, you know, the, the law talks about public-private partnerships. It does not define what a public-private partnership is. So it's, it's sort of like trying to handle jello a lot of times. So one of the things we want to do today is sort of dig into that. Like, what are we talking about when we talk about a P3? Um, the, the term it uses is qualifying project, which is pretty broad. Basically, any, any project that serves a public purpose can be covered by the statute. And then the other clunky term is responsible public entity, which would be the city. If, if you're reading through the law, when it talks about responsible public entity, um, it's talking about you, the buyer. Uh, of, of significance, and we'll, we'll get into this in a few minutes, it authorizes unsolicited proposals. So typically the government procurement process is the government initiates a solicitation or procurement process and industry responds to that. So one of the, the significant twists with the P3 law is the unsolicited proposal process where industry can initiate the, the process. Um, so that's significant. And then key too is it supplemental to existing authority um, that was a sticking point for, for the League of Cities, again, because Florida is a home rule jurisdiction, unlike Virginia. Florida governments had the authority to do P3s even without the statute. And you know, P3s have been done for more than a century. Um, so it's, even though it's new on the books and the law, as far as what Florida governments can do and have done, it's really been part of Florida um, government for, for a long, long time. So this is just one more um, quiver, you know, arrow in, in the quiver. If, if you want to do it, um, you can use this statute. So 
you know, when it comes to what are P3s, it was, um, here's two quotes that are attempts to describe what they are. And, and if you look at those, you know, one is an arrangement under which private firms become involved in financing, designing, constructing, owning, or operating. To my point, you've, you've been doing that forever. Every contract that the city enters into would fit into that definition. It's an arrangement whereby you're engaging the private sector to, to do something um, for you. The one on the right side, it, it also is contract oriented. That's from the Federal Highway Administration. Um, and it talks about, well, it's one of those, but we're shifting a little bit more risk to the private sector. So sometimes when people talk about P3s, they talk about it's a contract. Um, another way to talk about it at the bottom there, it's a procurement process, and under the P3 statute, it's that, because it's a process you can follow to put a contract into place. Um, another way to think about it is a financing method. One of the earlier speakers referred to it as a funding tool. Um, so that would be the financing method. It's, it's, it's a method, it's really not a source of money. Um, there's no free money here, um, but it is a method to structure a project. So I, I like the, the last phrase there, the project delivery method. So this is a way to get a project done. There's other ways to get projects done. So when, when you're thinking from the government side about you know, how we want to, uh, using this morning as an example, if you want to refurbish the yacht club, if that's the project, you could think about, well, would P3 be the be appropriate project delivery method? So again, there's no single, de it's not defined in law, it has many meanings. Um, we were on the board, the, when the law passed 10 years ago, there was a one year uh, committee that was set up that included state government, local government, and industry uh, participants and advisory board. The city of Tampa was the local government participant on that board, and the finance director for the city was, was the person in that role. Um, we were advising her at the time, and you know, one of the questions that comes up is, you know, is it a real P3? What is a real P3? And again, it's so broadly defined that that's not the best question um, to ask. And one of the jokes is, if you've seen one P3, you've seen one P3 because they, they can take a variety of forms. Um, one way to look at it, this, this is from an accounting perspective. So this is a board that is in charge of uh, federal accounting standards. So there's an, another board that's in charge of state and local government standards. But it, now, eight years ago, the feds started to look at this. How do we account for P3s? And from an accounting perspective, one of the things they're concerned about is it's considered off budget and off balance sheet. So that would be another way to describe a P3 if, if you think of it from you know, how, how it's accounted for. So one of, the, in this standard that they adopted in, you know, 2016, um, when they're looking as auditors, are we gonna treat this as a P3? So they're coming in after the fact. Um, one of their standards is if you meet any one of these criteria, we're gonna, we're gonna audit it as a P3. So the conveyance or creation of a long-lived asset or long-term financing liability. So if you create something that, that looks like a long-term financial obligation, um, then that's of interest to the auditors and, and the accountants. Um, so that's, that's one indicia of is this a P3 as opposed to a, you know, a regular contract. Um, Another is if the government participates in or is party to an entity that's created just to deliver the project. So S SPV is like special purpose vehicle or special project vehicle. So if a nonprofit is created um, to deliver a project and the government is, is part of the creation of that entity that's gonna be responsible for the project, um, 
then, then they would account for that as a P3. And again, I didn't know the context of this morning, but you know, if, if you had a say the Yacht Club um, entity created and the city participated in that, then that would be accounted for as, as a P3. Um, the, the transaction covers a significant portion of the economic life of a project. So for, for accounting purposes, assets are depreciated and they, they've got a life for, for accounting purposes. So if the transaction term is as long as the life of the asset, then the, the auditors would view that as a P3. So if you set up, often if there's a real estate component involved, something's built on real estate, the, the deal might be 30, 50, 70 years long, and it's gonna, the, the deal will last as long as whatever's put on that piece of property lasts, then the auditors would view that as a P3. Um, and then the, the principal arrangement is exempt from the FAR and the OMB. Those are the federal standards that govern procurement. So if it's done as a non-standard procurement, that's something that the auditors are gonna, gonna be um, looking at carefully. And it, again, for Florida, we don't really have that concern because now we have a P3 statute. So you, you can do the P3 under that. Um, then they, they say, well, what are other indicia is if maybe, maybe not, but if, if the, enough of these are present, the, the auditors would treat it as a P3. Value for money analysis is just um, jargon for a return on investment analysis that your accountants or financial advisors might um, perform. And what that suggests is it's not obvious. But usually when you buy something, it's very obvious. You, you pay $1,000 and you get a laptop. With the P3, it's not always as obvious what the government's getting in return for its investment in the project. That's where the value for money analysis can, can come in handy. Um, same thing with this second item, is, is it's the, the deals just look um, obscure, and it, it's, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what's changing hands between the government and, and industry. So if the auditors see that, then they're gonna wanna say, well, maybe we wanna account for this at, as a P3. Um, the third factor is significant activity between the two, the public sector and the private sector. Oftentimes, deals are very arm's length and oftentimes trust level is very low. Um, in, in a P3, there's much more long-term interaction and interdependence between the government and, and the private player. So that's, that's the auditors will look for that. Um, which leads to this fourth point. It's, it's much, this, and this is why trust, high trust levels are very important. There's a lot of collaboration and a lot of adaptation that, that's required because these projects tend to be difficult um, to, to accomplish. So the parties need to work together um, closely over a very long term. Um, and oftentimes, the government has to rely on the financial analysis of the private party, particularly if the private party is making an investment. So um, that's a, the, another factor. So one way to think about a, any project really, and this shifting from the auditing perspective to the procurement process perspective or the owner perspective, <clears throat> every project and asset has these steps in its life cycle. Someone has to pay for it. Someone has to plan it. Someone has to build it. Someone has to design it. Someone has to maintain it and operate it. In procurement world, it's the total cost of ownership, which, which you know in your personal experience, when you buy a car or you buy a house, that's not, the purchase price is not the end of the investment, right? You have to maintain it over its whole life, and that can be very expensive. The same is true with, with every asset. So, um, so what, what you're looking at from this perspective, under Florida's P3 statute, the only thing that can't uh, vary on, in this model is the ownership. 
So to be, to be a P3 project under the Florida statute, the government must ultimately own the asset. So it's not privatization, it's not selling off government assets under the P3 statute. But you, you wanna look at each of these variables in, in the project and, and figure out the, the, the traditional way of doing a project, we call design, bid, build. You go, you hire an architect, the architect makes your project plans, then you're done with that. Then you go do another procurement and you hire a contractor and you know the contractor builds your project, then the contractor goes away. And then typically the government maintains and operates the asset for, for its lifetime. You, you can contract for those services, but typically that's, that's self-performed. So these are the moving pieces. And really at P3, it's just a very complex deal where you can bundle all of these pieces and have one private party um, do some or all of these in, in a single transaction. So to the point about this is not a source of money, this is an example of, of I-4. The, the main point on this chart is you, you can see the private money contribution, the equity contribution to that project, which was a you know, $2.3 billion project, was just 5%. So because in, in the U.S. Uh, with tax-exempt financing, local governments typically, your, your cost of money is cheaper than what the private sector can, can get. So typically, a lot of the financing will, will still fall on the government side. And where there is private financing, it's, it's usually not significant. With the I-4 example, it was 5% of the project cost. Here's a local government um, project that got a lot of press out in California. And, and the takeaway here is, again, it was 4%. So, so the, the private contribution, the equity contribution to the cost of the project was minimal, which goes to my point is it's not a source of funding. It might be a funding tool. It might be a way to structure the transaction. But P3s are no magic. Um, panacea where you're going to get a bunch of private money um, brought to the project, typically. So on the unsolicited proposals, um, generally in usual deals, like I mentioned, the government, and you know, you as the policymakers set a budget, you, you make the decision about do we need this. The first fork in the road is, you know, do we even need this? Um, if, if you do need it, the next fork is do we do it ourselves or do we buy it from somebody? Um, and if you are going to buy it from somebody, that kicks off, then staff does the procurement process. They draft the RFP, they go out, they get bids, they get a contract, um, and then they manage the contractor's performance. That's sort of the top process. The unsolicited proposal is significantly different because by definition it's unsolicited. So it's, it's not something that's been in the usual planning process. It's not something that's necessarily in your budget when staff is accounting for what do we have to get done this year and how many people do we need to do it and how are we gonna devote those resources. None of that is done in advance. So they, they can be disruptive and it's, it's desired disruption. The idea is we, we should be open to good ideas from the private sector. So if the private sector pays attention and understands what government needs are, um, then they can bring ideas to the government. And the, the, the concept is we, we should be able, to, we as the government should be able to act on them pretty quickly. So that's what the unsolicited proposal process is. And the, if you, that's the bottom process flow. So if you get one of those as decision makers, the first step is, do, is it a qualifying project? Again, that's such a broad definition, that's usually a low hurdle to get over. Um, but then is it something that you, as a decision makers, want to proceed with and, um, under the P3 statute? And if so, then there is an advertisement step so there, there's still, you know, we, in public procurement, full and open competition and advertising and transparency are important values. So even on unsolicited proposals, if you're on that path, there comes a point 
where you do need to advertise it and seek competing proposals. So, you know, from an economic point of view, there's a significant first mover advantage. So, you know, in, in practice, the, 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 whoever tenders the unsolicited proposal usually has a huge head start on everybody else. Um, some, there was a report by Tax Watch this last legislative session about we should do away with the advertisement phase. That's not fair to the people who come up with the, you know, the great original idea. So there, that, there's debate about the wisdom of that step, but that is the law with unsolicited proposals. You have to advertise it, seek a competing proposal. Um, and then there's a process for moving into negotiations. Um, if you do get a competing proposal, you have to rank them just like a regular procurement, pick a winner, pick, pick a top ranked, and then start negotiation with, with that party. And then it, then it kind of follows a regular procurement path. So <clears throat> the key takeaway is this is a, it's an available tool. It can be very complex. It can be politically challenging. It, it can be expensive to procure because you, you have to pay sometimes for outside legal help, financial advisors, you know, programmatic help with architects and engineers, whatever the program area is. So why, would, why on earth would you do a P3? So the, the, the theoretical advantages are it can accelerate the project delivery, particularly with an uns unsolicited proposal, because you don't have to do the upfront planning. You can attract new capital. It, it, theoretically, yes. Practically, I don't think that's a huge advantage, because it's only going to be a small, usually a single digit um, contribution. The third one is you, you can take advantage of private sector innovations and efficiencies. Um, a lot of times, people who pursue these projects are really good at it in the private sector, and they're just looking to expand their market into the public sector. So usually, you're dealing with people who are very good at this. And then the contractual opportunity for the risk allocation is, is, is great if, it, if it's done right. Um, so what you really want to focus on is how best to allocate the risk between the government and the private sector. And you know the, the textbook is if you control a risk, then you should bear it. If, if, if neither party controls it, then you should share it. Um, but you know projects have a lot of risks. So when, when you're doing one of these, the, the real art to this is, figure out the risk profile of that particular project, and then allocate the risk appropriately between the two parties. So Ken will we'll get into more detail on allocating the risk. Good morning. Ken Artin with Bryant Miller Olive. Um, Fred and I work as a team. Fred gets you into the P3, and it's my job to make sure what you guys ask for is actually delivered. And there's actually, the stages of a P3 are incredibly important, starting right at the beginning. A big part of this is to identify what it is you want, the scope and the goals of the project. That takes time, and if time is not allocated to that very first step, you risk um, basically um, achieving what you wanted to achieve in the first place, or it may cost you more money than you actually thought. I am a strong proponent of spending the time up front, um, and then that makes my job easier, because then I know what you want, and it's my job to make sure that those agreements ultimately signed by everybody deliver the goals um, and achieve the goals that the, the city wants. And Fred mentioned allocating risks and rewards. That's what P3s are all about. Um, uh, speed of execution, um, who takes the risk of construction um, cost overruns? Who assumes the risk of late delivery? Who takes care of life cycle costs? I think in the public sector, the one thing that um, is uh, overlooked a great deal is once the building's up, who maintains it? How is it maintained? Who bears that cost? And a lot of governmental units, and um, I spent a lot of time with 
um, governments that are subject to state um, appropriations for life cycle costs. And it's, it, if you can shift that cost off to a uh, private party and remove the legislative risk of non-appropriation for deferred maintenance, um, that's a huge benefit to a project and an asset with respect to useful life. Once we've spent all that time up front, um, uh, basically identifying scope, goals, uh, what risks we want to share, what rewards we want to share, then we sit down and negotiate those agreements. And it does take a long time. And once you execute, you have to live with what you um, entered into, maybe. Big part of negotiating P3 agreements is, how do I get out of it? What if it doesn't work? 10 years down the road, how, what are, what's my exit strategy if you need one? If everything's working fine, great, it'll roll along. Usually these agreements are 30, 50 years. We just negotiated ground lease agreements on a redevelopment project for a coastal city on the east side. For, with 99 year ground leases. So these are long term agreements and so you have to have mechanisms in there to deal with um, if something goes wrong. Whoops, let's see. Okay, part of that first step is understanding the scope and goals. We've, we've talked about that. But you take those scopes and your goal and the goals and you put them into very clear as, as best you can into the RFP and the ITN process. The more that you can put into that document that the development community is going to look at and review and decide whether they're going to participate in, in this project is by telling them up front what you expect and what you're willing to pay or uh, basically what the rewards uh, system is going to look like with respect to um, this project. And then once everybody has a clear understanding, you sit down and start drafting the documents. P3 is basically selecting a partner. And one of the things that is very, very important is getting, entering into these agreements with a partner, with the right partner. It's not the cheapest partner. It's the partner that can deliver the project on time, on budget, maintain it, operate it, and again, achieving those goals that you set out to achieve. You have to know who your partner is. So part of the RFP ITN process is trying to glean that information um, out, of the, um, out of the community to get that feel for what other projects they delivered, what other governments have they um, partnered with. It is, um, this is a new arrangement not only for you, but it's for them too. If, if they own a piece of dirt, want to put up a um, high-rise multifamily housing project, they can do that all day long. Doing it with a government is, is a different process. And you, you need to know if they're willing and if they understand the, the differences of dealing with a governmental partner. Another important aspect of choosing your partner is make sure you have a partner that has some skin in the game. This is different than uh, Fred described a design bid build agreement. You pay someone to design a building or build a building, you uh, pay them a fee and then they're gone. If this is a 99 year or 50 year agreement, you want them to be at risk to lose something and nothing better than a good old fashioned equity contribution in the, um, in the project for them to pay attention, make sure that the project remains the shiny penny um, that will attract either residents or customers and generate the revenues necessary to pay for the project and maintain and pay for the life cycle costs. Skin in the game is important and oftentimes overlooked. And that's due to the fact that a lot of the development community is used to what we call fee-for-service arrangements. I'll do something, you pay me a fee, I'm gone. P3s are different from that aspect because you're basically entering into an agreement over a longer period of time, typically. And then 
the last aspect um, in choosing the partner is choosing a partner that um, can handle the risks and rewards. Make sure that they have the necessary capital to deal with cost overruns, life cycle costs. What happens if something uh, dramatic happens like a hurricane or a storm? How quickly can they get that asset back up and running? Those are key factors in uh, choosing a, um, a partner with respect to um, a particular project. So th this is another, you know, just a list of um, checklists of things that you might look at. I'm not going to spend time with all of them, um, but the, the um, and we're going to talk about uh, a bunch of these as we go along, but we do have a checklist that we would work with the city in going through and making sure that the selection of the partner is thorough and um, you wind up with the best partner that you can have. In negotiating the agreements themselves, it's, it's very important that um, these agreements memorialize the business arrangement that you expect or are expecting. And that's why we spend so much time up front understanding what it is you want to accomplish. And that time is well spent because then it's going to wind up um, in the negotiations with your partner and the agreements. When both parties understand um, the, the goals of the other party, it's much easier to draft these agreements um, versus going back and forth and trying to second guess what the other party wants. You know, our job is to determine what your goals and needs are, but also what does that developer need? What does he have to accomplish in order to make this deal um, sufficient for them to enter into a 30-year agreement with you guys? General considerations. Here, these are the things that we focus on in the um, agreements themselves that um, are uh, are really important with respect to um, um, you know the relationship that we're trying to establish clear representations and warranties the financial requirements of the parties are clearly set out in the agreements and how the cash is going to flow through the agreement you want to make sure that if the priority for this business is maintenance and life cycle costs that the cash is going there versus first versus paying equity returns to the investors in the project. It's managing the cash flow off of this project um, that is going to be um, critical in establishing the success or failure of that project. The other thing that is very important is procedures for resolving disputes. You do not want to be in a situation where you run to court every time somebody has an argument. We spend a lot of time um, building in a procedure that it, it's a three-step procedure. First, first step is we take the two principles, one from the city side, one from the developer side, lock them in a room for 10 days, no food, no water, and see if they can work it out. If they can't, then we go to a, a form of mediation. And where it, you know, it's, it, I'm sure you've gone through mediation processes before, but it's, it, it's another attempt to see if we can bring in a arbiter to understand the uh, reasons and the explanations of both sides to get to a, a result. And then finally, if, if nothing can be resolved, you do wind up in court. But we try to build in a procedure to resolve the, these disputes long before we have to go file something in, in, in court. Um, again, the uh, indemnification provisions, uh, our local government clients uh, cannot uh, basically enter into agreements with open-ended indemnification clauses. And we spend a lot of time with the private community um, basically explaining what we can and cannot do. And uh, also with legislative mandates, sovereign immunity, some of these concepts are very, very foreign to the development community, unless you've got uh, a well-seasoned uh, developer that is, or contracting party that is used to uh, basically dealing with local governments. And um, 
in equipment leasing, you see oftentimes uh, annual appropriation obligations. Well, that's, that's the equipment leasing industry. They're very familiar with how um, equipment leases get paid, but development community um, on um, hard asset type acquisitions or construction projects, it's a new concept. So we do spend um, a good deal of time trying to explain the special contracting um, provisions that we deal with uh, with respect to um, uh, dealing with local governments. This slide is important because this is where you lose money. If, if we don't have a firm understanding of what happens in a force majeure situation, and this is um, what happens in a pandemic, what happens um, after a hurricane, um, you know, uh, if the force majeure clause says, uh, we will give you, Mr. Developer, extra time to accomplish what needs to be accomplished, that's great. That's fine. But if the force majeure clause says, well, if it was out of my control, uh, you got to pay for it. Well, that's an unexpected cost that, um, you know, may or may not be built into the budget. So having a firm understanding of force majeure is critical. And what's important, it's these are concepts that you have to think about that may affect the project 10, 15 years down the road. And so it's not just getting in a project and getting a building up and running, it's how do you maintain that relationship over the course of the, um, the term of the agreement. Termination rights. Um, you know, this is that clause, how do you get me out of this? It's not working out, the citizens are not happy with how the project's being managed, how do I get myself out of it? And there's several different, uh, many different ways to deal with termination clauses um, in beyond the scope of today's meeting, but it's an important concept that you have to spend time thinking over. Change orders. This is an incredible money gap, um, if, unless you control it. Change orders that you just have to have usually come with a the cost of, all right, if you got to have gold-plated faucets in the restrooms, then you have to pay for it. And so it's the unexpected change orders that um, basically add cost um, to a project. And also, change orders may be necessary. You know, the, maybe the architect or um, <clears throat> engineer misplaced where the um, stairwells go. Those change orders have to be made and they also have to be, the reaction time to change orders has to be taken into account because the very next thing, deemed approval versus deemed rejection. Time is important to a developer that's putting up a building where his money's at risk. So he's going to want uh, to be able to move quickly with something that happens on the project site. And again, there's ways of dealing with this, but this is an important uh, consideration that takes time. Um, reporting requirements and audit rights. Here, we build into the agreement the information that you guys would want to have um, access to over the life of the agreement, just to monitor what's going on. How is performance, how is the manager, the property manager um, working? How, what is, how are the financial um, uh, cash flows uh, performing on the project? You, you need to build in the right to get this information. You may not need it, you may not pay attention to it if everything's going well, but you need the reporting requirements built into your agreement so you can monitor this project over the life um, of, the, of the asset, especially in a 50-year lease type situation. Staff is gonna change. They're in, the new people will need to know how they can get their hands around if this project is performing the way it was supposed to perform 20 years ago when the city gets into it. It's these reporting requirements and the audit rights that are gonna give future administration the rights um, to get that information and monitor the project. Um, here, um, I'll spend two seconds on this. W one of the things that the developer is going to do is the developer is gonna wanna go borrow money from his 
bank or investors. And so they're going to want to have some sort of superiority rights over those of the city. Um, and, and they'll either have that through a mortgage or um, other security agreement. Here, we have to give the investors or the banks lending into this project rights to replace the developer, uh, bring in a new developer if, if the project's not complete and they're gonna lose their money. Worst thing that could happen to a bank is the developer defaults under our ground lease, if that's the structure, um, and we have grounds to terminate. Once we terminate the ground lease, not only is the developer out in the cold, but so is the lender, because all of their rights derive from that underlying P3 agreement. So here, they're going to wanna to make sure that they have what we call step-in rights uh, in order to uh, do what's necessary to either complete the project, keep it running, because they have to get paid. So it's important here to give them those step-in rights, <coughs> but you draft into the agreements the concept of, all right, you'll have the rights to control the developer, replace the developer, but if you sit on your hands and you don't do anything, we have rights that can come in. The worst thing that could happen is they take years and years and years to duke it out and replace a developer in the project um, sits fallow for all those years. We have to prevent that from happening and we do that by limiting the rights that um, are not subordinated um, to the lender. Um, again, here we've talked about um, um, the various ways of protecting a city's rights in these long-term agreements. Um, I think we've talked about all of them except the one on the bottom, control, uh, control the removal of, of the manager. Here, um, to use an example, say you, you do have an uh, asset, it's built, it's, it's being maintained, but it's just not generating the use that you expected it, due to the property manager ineffectively handling the asset. You want to be able to not necessarily terminate the ground lease, or the underlying agreement, but you do want to have rights to deal with that property manager. Get um, the property, get a property manager in there that will increase utilization of the asset, increase the revenue flow. I mean, the city under their agreements may be counting on the ground rent that's coming back in um, after all the other cash flow needs are uh, met with the project. So, um, support provisions. Here, depending upon the nature of the support, what these are is what, <clears throat> what are your promises to the developer? Um, do you agree to um, use the facility as the sole use of whatever the facility is generated, marina or to use the yacht club? You're gonna have all of your city meetings um, at this yacht club to generate the revenues necessary in addition to all the other general public use. It's what, what do you promise to help this project as the sponsor of the project? In here, very slippery slope. You just have to be, um, be conscious of the more support that you put into the project, financial or otherwise, you then become responsible for whatever that's financial or um, uh, support will cost the city as far as dollars and cents. So um, we, and this is more on some of the projects we work that are, uh, work on that are revenue generating and um, the, the tendency here is in the development community, the more support that is shown by the sponsor they use that to go argue to the lender that the project is that much more secure. And that brings us to the end of um, the presentation and the materials that we wanted to cover today. Um, we understand that um, we've covered a lot of turf, um, but if you have any questions or if you want to talk about anything in particular, uh, Fred and I are available for that. Thank you very much. And do we have any uh, questions? Appreciate the uh, presentation today. The uh, very informative. Um, I think it's uh, was probably uh, best for our new council members uh, to to go through this. 
and uh, a, a great refresher for, for the council that's uh, been here for a while. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I, I, have, yes, sir. Uh, I just would like to see if uh, Fred can cover a, a couple items before we uh, move on to the next item. So the, the first question, uh, Fred, that if you could, um, can you discuss whether or not a city can work with a vendor to develop an unsolicited uh, P3 uh, prior to submittal? So under a traditional framework where we're working on an, an RFP and we're going to be soliciting for a specific set of uh, project criteria or uh, project, um, there's prohibitions about uh, allowing one vendor to help write that and then ultimately awarding that. Are there any differences in the unsolicited uh, P3 approach or any, um, anything that we should note um, with that? Yes, thanks. So if you look at this slide on the unsolicited proposal process, the general principle is the same because there's a competitive step. You don't, the competition requires a level playing field in general. So on that top, when you're doing a solicited proposal, the first half of that, the first four steps, procurement staff is free to interact with the market. They, they should do market research, go, go talk to vendors, talk to potential suppliers, figure out what the market has to offer. There's a lot of interaction in a traditional procurement on the first um, three steps particularly. When you get to the fourth steps, when you're creating a sourcing strategy, how are we gonna do this with the RFP? Um, you can't have somebody write an RFP and then bid on it. That's like a textbook example of bad practice. Um, so, you know, generally the closer you get to a competitive event, you want to have more distance with, with the market because you, you, you don't want them to tip the playing field in their favor. Now, again, with the unsolicited proposal, um, by definition, they've come to you first. Now, no, nobody comes to you out of the clear blue. It, it, they're, they're not that dumb, right? No one's gonna put time and effort into creating an unsolicited proposal if they don't think there's some chance that it might lead to an actual deal. So there, there's going to be some interaction um, with the government before the tendering of the unsolicited proposal because otherwise they you know, would be a waste of their time. The art there is to, um, they can pick up information in public meetings, um, through, through workshops, even one-on-one, -on -one, making, helping industry understand what the government's needs are is to your advantage. Because going back to one of the advantages of P3 is that they can bring their creativity and efficiencies to, and solutions to you. They need to understand what problems you're trying to solve. So you want some level of interaction. The closer you get to a competitive event is where you want more distance from them. And understanding after they so tender the unsolicited proposal, there must be that advertisement and, and competition event. That's where you want the most separation. So you, you can, it's, it's kind of like a funnel. At the very beginning, in, in the needs assessment, the needs understanding, putting out the word to the you know, industry, we're struggling with this problem. We see this all over the country, really, like with affordable housing. It's no secret that every government's trying to solve the affordable housing problem and, and working with people to you know, come up with solutions. As you get closer to an actual competitive event, that's where you want the, the distance. And once they've submitted that unsolicited proposal, then they are treated as, as a competitor, basically, because other people will, will come in. So once the unsolicited proposal comes in, what, what can you do? Is the, um, the second, is it a desirable qualifying project? You, you can, you set up a process to intake these. Someone looks at it and says, this is a qualifying project as defined in the statute, and then goes to decision makers and says, do we want to pursue this project? And you get a yes or a no. Um, you, can, you can say, no, we don't want to do it under the P3 statute. 
but we want to do it some other way. There's, there's lots of different processes that you have available to, to accomplish projects. You just need to, if an idea comes to you, recognize it as an idea, bubble it up to the right level of decision making, have somebody say, yes, pursue this, and then going to Ken's point about the early upfront planning, we're gonna pursue it on this path with these objectives in mind, and you know, then let staff run that process um, to, to conclusion. So once you get it, you, you've got a variety of decision points um, after that. Thanks, Rita. And, and just to tease apart that last, uh, that last aspect, which is once the municipality receives an unsolicited proposal, it, it's not a foregone conclusion that we follow the, the Florida statute process, right? We, we will have a series of decisions to make at that point on, well, I guess one, you know, should we dispose of it? Does it, is it not a project we want to move forward with? Two, is there some administrative remedy or solution we have? Or three, do we want to continue on the process? And then the administrative remedies could be several, correct? Right, which is the, the supplemental to existing authority. You, you've had the ability to accomplish projects long before 2013. This, this P3 process is just one more process. The, the key, in my mind, is to be clear which process are we following. Because if, if you don't know, first of all, have good processes. I know, I think you've got a local, and the legislature encouraged local governments to kind of fill in the blanks with your own local legislation and your procurement policy. So there should be a well-defined process so industry knows, how do I submit an unsolicited proposal? What needs to be in it? Who do I give it to? That, that helps facilitate receipt of them. And then you want, we've had, representing a private client once, tendered an unsolicited proposal, and then it was so clear that the government was so ill-equipped um, that, that our client withdrew it after eight weeks because the, the government just didn't know what to do with it. And the, the client was like, well, that's a bad sign. Um, you know, the, the industry's looking for governments who can get projects done in you know, a reasonably fast, coherent manner. If, if you're, and you're competing with other jurisdictions because every, juris, you know, every coastal town in Florida can do an unsolicited proposal. So developers are looking, just like you're looking for a good private partner, they're looking for good government partners. And that includes manageable political risk, just the, the process risk. It's not gonna take, you know, something that could be done in a month shouldn't take six months. So that's the kind of stuff they're gauging when they're deciding who to go tender proposals to. But so you should have those decision points of we got it, it's a qualifying project, we want to pursue it, we're going to pursue it on this path rather than that path. Those are decisions that need to be made in pretty you know, rapid succession. Thank you, Fred. Any other comments before we move on to the next topic? You got some? Go ahead. Uh, Thank you. I, I, I don't want to minimize the complexity of a, of a P3, but I would like to get just some kind of an idea if it's at all possible, and that is um, if, it was a, if it was a public only or a private only project, obviously there's, there's design, there's engineering, um, there's construction, and then beginning of operation. Um, in a P3, is there any way to say, you know, if you go P3 rather than doing it yourself as a municipality or allowing it to be, you know, just a private um, project, is there any scope of kind of the extra time that's involved to put the P3 together? Is it a, hey, realize that if you're going to do a, a, you know, a P3 project that you're probably looking at six months or 12 months more uh, before th that project is uh, open and available to the public? Is, is there any sense of how long it takes to put these things together that you've spoken of, of how important it is to kind of cross all the T's and you know, dot all the I's? Is any perspective on that? Yeah, and theoretically, that's the value for money analysis. A lot of times what the consultants will do is they'll, they'll track 
what the P3 process would look like and all the, the costs and um, benefits that go along with that. And they'll compare that to a traditional um, project and all of the effort that, that goes into that. So that, that can be mapped out by consultants and they'll model them and then you can compare them. Um, in reality, they, they take longer because they're more complex, um, but it's time well spent. So it feels like it's a long time, but again, to Ken's point, if it's gonna be a 30 or 50 year deal, you, you want to put the time in on, on the front end. And then in practice, it, it depends. Some organizations, you know, up the maturity model, they're, they're just faster um, and time is money. Um, they are faster at getting deals done because, you know, it's not their first one. They, they've done them enough. Um, they've got a well-oiled decision-making machine that questions are framed, elevated, decided, and you move on. So in practice, a lot depends on the organization. In, in theory, you can model them and, you know, have consultants say this, this is what the expected cost would be to go through this process. The traditional process seems shorter, but once you stack up all of the different steps, because you got to do a procurement for your designer, you got to do a procurement for your constructor, you might have to go do your lending somewhere else, then you've got to figure out how you're going to do the maintenance and operation. When you stack all that stuff up, that's what you're comparing to the P3 if you're trying to bundle that into one deal. But the, the value for money analysis is where that kind of comparison is captured. Okay, well, thank you. And the, the reason for the question is, is patience is running thin on a number of um, projects that the, that the city you know, faces and is, is considering. And as patients run thin, uh, a recognition of it being time well spent uh, to do that has to be a consideration that people understand, hey, I know we want it yesterday, although putting in this additional time to make sure it's done right and, and done in a value-oriented way through a P3 relationship, that it would be worth the time and effort to do that. Right, right, and it, it, at that level, because you can do solicited P3s, not just unsolicited, and again, that can just be a more complex, you know, we've been doing design-build projects in Florida for, you know, decades, that's a P3 as well. People understand how to do a design-build project. You know, if design-build, maintain, and operate, that's just a little more complex, it's gonna take a little bit more time, but you, you can, when, if you're going to plan for them and budget for them and then figure out, then procurement staff has to figure out what's the priority. You know, if, if we're going to do these six projects this year or 12, whatever the number is, what's the sequence that we're going to do them in? All of that's the planning that, that goes in at, at the staff level. And then the unsolicited proposal is what can upset all of that because suddenly this gets introduced in, into the process without being you know, so systematically for, planned sure. for, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Mr. City Manager, you have anything else on that topic? I do not, thank you. All right, thank you. We'll move on to uh, item uh, B2, which is special events. Uh, and I guess uh, our parks director is going to give that presentation. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Joe Petrella, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, I'm gonna just give the beginning of the presentation and then we're gonna have Todd King, our Special Event Supervisor, come and provide the remainder. So this is a little slideshow that we just kind of put together uh, in follow-up to our um, previous meeting on March 23rd. Uh, 2003. That video doesn't seem to be working, so we'll move on to the next slide. All right, so this is the question that we had to um, get that followed up was City Council, some of the things that were the questions that came out was one, City Council determining the budget amounts per category of the events that we have, which holidays have events and which do not additional holiday events and a list of holiday events that we currently have and defining what the city will provide for partnerships and impact for previous events versus what is contributed. 
So we'll let Todd take you through the rest of the way here. And for some odd reason, they're not lining up. Yeah, I see that. Good morning, Council. Todd King, Special Events Coordinator. I've got the best job in the city for sure because we impact quality of life here in our community and we're ranked very high on the importance for our citizens. Some of the questions that were brought up March 23rd that Joe went through, uh, we were asked to do a smaller, shorter presentation just to kind of address those and answer those questions that you guys might have had. We came up with our special events categories uh, that were presented in that meeting, but gave you more definition for today's follow-up meeting. The city produces events, general fund budget council approved in the budget season. So city produced events. These are events that are turnkey events. The city produce includes budgeting, entertainment acquisition, department coordination, operational and venue planning, turnkey logistics, and day of execution, load in, load out, review and evaluation. City produced means A to Z. This is an event that is coordinated by the special events division, involves the departments throughout the city, public works, police and fire, all the elements and components that go on to putting on this large major event in our city. City supported events, and this is where it kind of I think some of the questions came as a result of you guys asking this in-kind support to city assets. So what that means is city supported events, city supported events are limited to 501c3s. These are organizations that are non-for-profit. These organizations focus on raising money and awareness in the community. The support includes planning assistance, that's working with our division to assist with the planning of a venue or an activity. Capital equipment, capital equipment could range from generators to electrical boxes to cables of what they might need. Budget funds for the city services. This is limited to life safety and road closures. Budgeted funds are gonna engage in a grant program that we're initiating, but budget funds are gonna be specifically related to safety and road closures. And partnerships for the volunteer program. Again, there were some questions related to that too, but we'll get to that in a minute, okay? Independent events, independent events, no city support needed. This would be a private promoter comes into town, wants to do a special event related to uh, a holiday or an activity. The definition of an independent event differs from other events. Event producers work with the city to permit and rent assets that are needed as, as made available. The independent event needs no grant or partnership assistance from the city. So that would be our independent. So we break it down for you guys in the produced, supported, and independent events. Let's see if I got that. Oh, it worked. So city produced events. We further drilled down on that to our signature events. We outlined below in our slideshow the, uh, what we considered our signature events, events like our city bike nights, red, white, and boom, sounds of jazz and blues, the coming online New Year's Eve event, tour to Cape, the Culture Fest that we just launched this year in March, Holiday Boat Parade, which is one of our biggest holiday events down in the Bimini Basin, our new Trunk or Treat event, which engages our City Hall on the lawn at City Hall activity area that we're working on, Holiday Tree Lighting, which was the first one this year. Mayor, great job on lighting the tree. Um, Holiday Reindeer Run, which is a new one we did up at Coral Oaks, and our Music and Art Fusion Walks down on 47th Terrace. Neighborhood events, again, are bouncing around a different postage stamp or our parks that are located in specific neighborhoods. We're doing our movies in the park. There'll be three of those, and that'll move around to different districts and different, different parks, and concerts in the park, which will be small, come out on the Friday evening, Saturday evening for a nice concert in the park. And again, these are focused on a neighborhood targeted area for neighborhood events. One thing that I think we wanted to key in on this short abbreviated uh, presentation was event programs. Throughout our city, in our Parks and Recreation Department, beyond the Special Events Division, many, many event programs take place. The, a lot of these are held at recreational facilities and uh, parks that are coordinated by those facilities, events like daddy-daughter dance, date night, peewee Halloween, 80s Halloween dance. So if you go through our program calendar and our program guide that Parks and Recreation produces, you'll discover that there are many, many quote-unquote special events going on at the event programs level. 
So city signature events, neighborhood events, and then event programs. City supported events. So after we just went through our list of produced, again, those are the level of produced events, turnkey A to Z. We also have our city produced, uh, city supported events. The city supported events are limited to 501c3 organizations. I want to make that clear too. These organizations focus on raising money and awareness in the community. The support, in support includes planning assistance, capital equipment, budgeted funding for city services limited to safety, road closure, and partnership volunteer programs. Down below is a list of these particular events. Some of you may be aware of some of them as well, but again, the city comes alongside being a 501c3A to create an experience for the community, another activity, as well as assist that 501c3 with their community awareness and perhaps raising money for that particular organization. City independent events we defined, those are folks that come into our town and do a turnkey produced event, taco festival, St. Patty's Day block party down by cork soakers, stone crab festival. These are definition of independent events, differs from, difference from other events, event producers work with the city for permitting and rent assistance and are made and that stuff is made available. The independent event needs no budget funds or partnership assistance from the city. One of the other questions that were addressed was the holiday events in the city, uh, what is taking place. We did this slide to give you kind of an idea of each month and holiday that's going on. And we also identified the city produced, and again, by definition, that's turnkey A to Z. Uh, city produced events are gonna be in red. This is to give you kind of an awareness that we are striking a significant number of holidays throughout the community and providing quality of life and opportunities for uh, residents on the holiday events. We also wanted to show you the national holidays that we do not have a special event planned. And you know we're kind of addressing that, looking at some of those and maybe we can find ways to engage those, but Martin Luther King Day, President's Day, Memorial Day has smaller ceremonies that do take place. It's more of a solemn event uh, for recognition of the fallen, so Memorial Day takes place at a lot of the smaller ceremonies. Um, Juneteenth, Independence Day, which is in June, uh, Labor Day and Columbus Day. These are kind of events that are not being supported by a private event, 501c3, or city-produced events, but we are looking at expanding those ideas. One of the major questions too that was brought up is how does the partnership program work and why is it important? So we target the 501c3 organizations conducting a community event. That support, the support is limited to city capital assets. The partnership program is designed to create a win-win for city and partners. Utilization of city capital equipment save the 501c3 organization on rental expenditures on needed equipment for their activity. The in-kind capital requests do not and often do not exceed $10,000 for a single event. Most of the capital assets that go out are way under $10,000 for these 501c3s. The idea of the partnership is to create the budget savings for the 501c3 so that we can maximize the donation to the organization. Let's say they're doing breast cancer or a walk in the park for breast cancer. By providing these assets and giving them an opportunity to not have to rent that equipment, they save a significant amount of money and it's able to go directly into that 501c3 or donation to that. What we get out of it, and I listed those down below, the city win, we get quite a bit out of it. City receives volunteer support on city produced events. To be able to do an event as large as Red, White, and Boom, we've got to have a lot of help. And through this volunteer program where we're utilizing the city assets and creating that connection uh, through that value, we are able to uh, support the event like Red, White, and Boom. City saves overtime expenses to fill event critical positions. Some of those positions can be filled by volunteers that in turn we would have to use a city staffer on a holiday or a 4th of July and there would be overtime expenses. So that's a win for us not having that cost. Volunteer hours are tied to specific event. This is kind of a new concept. We used to do a dollar for dollar 
based on commercial rental of a piece of equipment to a dollar for a valued at a volunteer hour. We just felt that kind of got convoluted after the first presentation, you guys. We kind of took a reworking of that. So now in our negotiation with the 501c3 to utilize that city capital, we're able to uh, come up with a plan that just targets a specific event that the volunteer group or 501c3 can engage in. Similar to how we do it with our Rotary Club. Our Rotary Club handles our adult beverage sales at all our events. Each event is targeted where they support the city for those particular things. They get a lot of 501c3 support for the art festival on the Cape Coral Parkway. And then the, the sidebar benefit that we get out of that is the city gets recognition in the sponsorship for those elements that we provide. So we get the volunteer hours and we get recognized as the sponsor. Partner win, rental cost savings on average two to four thousand dollars. That's additional two to four thousand dollars that could potentially move towards the uh, organization's fundraising and things that they're doing for that 501c3. Uh, the high maintained city assets. So when we roll our gear out, we know that it's the best gear maintained through our PM management program for facilities and fleet take care of our gear and it's highly maintained and it increases the funding like I said for the supported cause. Volunteer program is mission critical to the success of city produced events and I just wanted you guys to understand that without the volunteers the signature events such as bike night, red white and boom and all those on the signature side would be very hard to accomplish. Some of them engage up to 50 volunteers to be able to pull off. City supported partnership program. I did it. So one of the things you guys had some questions about was what kind of capital goes out or what, is this, what are these 501c3s using in assets or what is the special events putting out there to support. Um, capital assets are provided to city supported events via the partnership program. These items are also available for rent to city independent events. Y'all are familiar with the stage that we have, electrical distribution panels and boxes. That's to move electricity through for vendor areas, vendor rows, and things like that. Electrical distribution hubs, cables to move that power, bleachers, electric, electrical cable ramp to protect for trip hazards, trash barrels, bicycle barricade, which is crowd control. That is actually owned by the Rotary, but we do a partnership with the Rotary to, to utilize that equipment. Trussing, which supports banners and flags and trash, barrel, trash bags and trash barrels. So that is what our starting point or our list of starting point items that we provide 501c3s. This list was developed over years of what they've been asking for, what their needs are when the city comes alongside to support a partnership with an event, a 501c3. Sometimes those change, like there might be something that would come up where they would request a specific piece of equipment through proper approval and through following the, the guidelines. That equipment may roll out to support a specific need for a 501c3 in this particular program. We developed this list just out of what is readily utilized in, in the events that we produce or they produce as a supported partnership program. Measuring an event impact. In 2016, the Parks and Recreation Master Plan Survey indicated that having special events is the top priority for residents. Okay? Quality of life impact. Connects families, friends, creates a sense of community pride, promotes diversity, inclusion, and community engagement, and local to, local to the national celebration. So quality in life is very, very critical to bringing the community together and building that heartbeat. Economic impact contributes to tourism in Cape Coral, entices spending from visitors and retains them. Local spending that may authorize leave the area for entertainment increases in tax revenues and business community engagement. So looking at the impact as an overall umbrella, these are the kind of the two ideas, one focusing clearly on quality of life and what it's like to be out there at a special event. I've seen many of you come out and support and see us at an event, especially Red, White, and Boom, and just see the people out there enjoying what we're doing and that quality of life we provide uh, in that area. And then obviously economic impact is a large bubble. I'll stand by for questions. Uh, thank you. I hope it clarified a little bit.
on what it is that we do in special events is what it is that we define those, readdress those questions that you guys had from the March 23rd presentation. Go ahead. Well, before you open it up to questions, the video is too good to pass up and it's ready to go. If John, if you can hear us, if you could show that video, that'd be awesome. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Well, it is a good video. There we go. Maybe they'll rerun it. Here we go. That is your special events team right there. There's three of us to occupy that division, and we're going to get it again. So I stand by to answer questions. Again, this was a follow-up presentation to address the questions you brought to us March 23rd. I hope it brought clarity, but if, it, if there's some things you may still have in your minds, I'm available to answer those. Thank you, uh, Mr. City Manager. Do you have anything to add before I uh, open it up to council? Yeah, I think if we just, uh, uh, the intent of today's presentation was to close the loop from the, from the last uh, one where we, we sought guidance on, on where to go and, and what questions council needed that uh, answered. So uh, on slide three, we had uh, those. One was uh, basically having council determine the budgeted amounts per category, whether it's city sponsored, city supported, or private. So you, you see in the definitions that on the, on the private event, um, it's all the all the uh, equipment we have is available for rent so really we're only talking about uh, budgeted amounts for city sponsored um, as well as uh, city supported uh, we did produce a list of the holidays which do not have a, a special event so we'll be looking for some guidance this morning on whether or not you'd like us to be planning for a budgeted event next year um, we also put together the uh, definitions for uh, which each of the categories are. They're really uh, straightforward. Um, we either perform it ourselves and budget it. Uh, we support 501c3s um, or the private sector covers it. Um, just looking for um, support with that. And then lastly, um, there was some discussion about how do we quantify and how are we going to measure what uh, an event brought to the community. Uh, we're still working on kind of putting putting that that matrix together so that it would be available uh, for the community and council to determine if you want to continue with budgeting or supporting an event moving forward. Okay, with that being said, I'll uh, open up for any uh, council uh, discussion. Uh, council member Cummings. Um, first of all, I like the video. That was really good. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Melissa's crew in communications did it for us, and they did a phenomenal job. It was great. And it's on the web for advertising what we do, yeah. Yeah, I really liked it. <clears throat> as far as holidays are concerned, I definitely feel like we should be in support of holidays. Um, <clears throat> especially, you know, I feel like some have been left out. Memorial Day, I feel like we should do something. Um, I think it's great that there are areas here in Cape Coral that uh, partake in it, but I feel like as a city, we should be as well. Um, Martin Luther King Day, absolutely. I feel in the holidays for city, we should be sponsoring them. As far as the 501c3, I feel that that should be on them. That's why they do fundraisers um, and have money coming in that they should be handling that themselves. That's my opinion. And um, thank you. Council Member Steinke. Thank you. Uh, first, Todd, uh, 
amazing uh, job. Thank I've you. attended numbers of the events. You've allowed me on stage a couple times. And, <laughs> and uh, the amount of work that goes on uh, for these events is uh, people don't grasp uh, all the coordination uh, and all the hard work that's done to get it set up, get it taken away, and have it run successfully uh, between the two. Uh, so uh, thank you for the work that you do, that you do there. Uh, I, I think the differentiation that you've laid out is, is fantastic. It makes it a lot easier to understand the difference between the events and by having them listed in the categories uh, allows us to understand um, whether we should or shouldn't and how we mm -hmm. should fund uh, certain events. So that is extremely helpful and I think if we were uh, to look at uh, adding uh, national holidays uh, that we currently don't have uh, anything planned for to determine which one of those categories that would fall into uh, would be you know kind of a first step that would be important uh, and to some degree my experience limited as it is is that kind of what we've got going seems to be working okay um, and so I don't know whether um, it's something that's broken that needs to be fixed um, right. uh, other than simply to you know establish what that budget is um, uh, and if the budget that we have been using for the events up until now and the support that we've given to organizations has been well received in the past, uh, I would, I would uh, say that we should kind of stay the course would be where I would be. Just real quickly, uh, Councilman Cummings, the 501c3 support does give us the volunteer hours back, which is mission critical to doing the signature events that we do in the city. So they're not just getting the value of the capital assets that we would roll out for them and help them. We are saving them money, of course, for sure, because they're not having to go out to rent it. But the give back to us is the volunteer hours that they provide at these major events, which is literally almost impossible not to have that. So it's a value for value. So it's a win-win when we set that up as the partnership program. So. That's why the 501c3s are part of that supported program uh, category. I hope that clarified a little bit. Anything else? You good? Okay. Uh, just real quickly before I go to Council Member Welsh, uh, since you mentioned volunteer hours, I know uh, in the past I've heard, uh, you know, a lot of times there's a lot, a lot of promises made, but unfortunately uh, those promises aren't fulfilled when it comes to volunteer hours. So, you know, can you give us a little bit of background with that? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, if, if we're going to make that, uh, if we're going to make that agreement, mm -hmm. we have to make sure that both sides are, are holding up their agreement. 100%. And that's why we're kind of flipping it to a new concept where we're, they're going to identify an event that they're going to volunteer for as an organization. That's going to lock them in when we get, get that organized support. It won't be this long encumbered number of hours related to and keep following up and they're picking and choosing when they want to step in we're going to hold them to a particular event at that moment we are working on a penalty structure related to if they don't fulfill the hours whether they have to come back and then make up the difference in the rental or something like that so we're looking at a penalty structure the hard thing is we're trying to maintain that relationship 501c3s are great most of them are serving amazing causes a lot of them so it's important for us to have a good middle ground on how we address them not fulfilling the hours that they committed to so identifying specific events that they're going to plug into at the moment of that partnership transaction we're going to need this equi this equipment this piece and we do that partnership transaction they'll be plugged right into an event and then that commitment will be held and it'll be held to then a penalty phase if there's if they're not fulfilled yeah, for me, that penalty phase would be pretty, uh, pretty easily to identify. If they don't fulfill their obligation from the previous yes. event, 100%. then we're not going to support you for the next one. It's pretty simple. Uh, Council Member Welsh, go ahead. You're up next. Um, you actually took everything I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry. I was, no, it's all right. I was happy to see that we've got the, I know um, with some of the events and volunteer hours, there was an audit on it not too long ago. And was found it wasn't being done correctly, so I was happy to see that in the presentation that you have a new system or structure that you're working on. Because I, as one of the volunteers that's worked uh, the beer tents at bike night for Rotary um, and, and things like that and other events, um, I think it's important. 
and being able to help support the community with city assets is also important. So I'm glad we're revamping it and I uh, encourage you to go in that direction. We're um, also, sorry to interrupt, but we're also engaging a, a program, a software called Vlogistics that will track that they apply for or they put their hours in and they can identify through a drop down box whether they're volunteering for the American Cancer Society or whoever is associated with that particular group or, or gear. But Vlogistics is really going to kind of help us with the analytics. Then Mayor better define who gets a penalty and who doesn't because we want to make sure we're fair and equitable in that. And just utilizing the software tool called Vlogistics, we're going to lock that down. Yeah, so like I said, I, I, I'm happy to see what, what we have here. I'm, I'm in support of the city events. I'm in support of the city supporting local 501c3s as well. And I think uh, for a team of three to put on some of these events that you guys do, um, obviously does need volunteer hours, but uh, you guys do a great job at it. So thank you. thank you. Okay, I guess I'll jump in here before I give uh, a few other council members their, their second time around. Um, you know, for me, I think it's important that, number one, uh, of course, uh, as far as our job is concerned, uh, is, is two things. Number one, to, to, a, to identify the budgetary number uh, so we can uh, have these particular events successful. Also, I think it's important for uh, us to approve the criteria on these three different types of special event categories to make sure um, no matter who it walks through the door that wants to participate in uh, any one of these categories that the criteria is crystal clear. One of the things that I see missing for me under the city supported events is uh, I think uh, there should be some type of a uh, sentence in there, an event that the community as a whole can participate in. Um, because we are still providing some, some support. Uh, we're paying staff to set up equipment. We have our special events team that does an excellent job each and every time out there working hard for those events. You know, for me, if we are going to sponsor an event, uh, it has to be an event that the community as a whole can participate in. Um, not saying that any particular event, uh, if they don't meet that criteria, can't go down to the independent uh, event. And I'll give you some examples. You know, um, say Black Lives Matter or an atheist group wants to come in and have an event in our city. Uh, I don't know if those types of events, if everyone in the community could or would participate in those types of events. So does it meet the criteria as a city supported event? I don't know. Um, you know, so I think that's extremely important when we're developing the criteria for me. Uh, to me, if the city is going to support an event, then the community as a whole should be able to participate in it. If they can't, then that means that that particular event may have to slide down to an independent event. Not saying they can't have it. Uh, it's just that uh, we as a city may not provide services for that particular event. I think that's a missing component for me personally in the, uh, in, in the classifications here. Uh, I think it's important to develop that criteria no matter who walks through the door then. Here's the five criteria that you have to meet. If you meet them, great. Then, uh, and we, we have enough of a budget to uh, either add you or make it a yearly event. Then um, I think that, uh, you know, that makes it fair for everyone that's applying. The other thing that I think that we have to make sure that we do is we know that the CRA uh, participates uh, monetarily sometimes for some of these events. Once council develops that criteria, that criteria must be for all the events no matter if the city or the CRA are participating uh, monetarily for, or supporting any of those events. I think that's important as well. Um, the volunteer hours, it sounds like uh, we've addressed that. That was one of the concerns uh, that I had as well. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. I just think uh, the city supported events were missing a component for me that the city as a whole can participate. Uh, I do like the 
uh, the events that we put on, the city produced events. You know, I think all of these events are to try to bring the community together. And that's what our goal is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, your staff does a great job doing that each and every year. Uh, you know, I know 4th of July, you're out there at 6 o'clock in the morning. Actually, uh, 3 a.m. there. 3 a.m., sorry. <laughs> so uh, I know that, uh, you know, you need all the help you can get. Thank you. You can't do it all with just the staff that you have. You need those volunteers. Um, one event that I think, uh, I think Council Member Cummings had mentioned uh, that I would support adding uh, this next budget cycle, uh, I agree with the Memorial Day uh, type of event. You know, we, uh, I just attended two separate events uh, in the morning uh, here in the city. Uh, I would be nice to see some type of a Memorial Day uh, event uh, either on 47th, Cape Coral Parkway, uh, you know, a lot of families are off that day, and I think, I think we could incorporate some type of a, uh, a program uh, very similar to, like, art festival or something. Or I know uh, Linda, I see her in the audience here. You know, th she does a great job with the uh, Veterans Day Parade. Mm -hmm. You know, something, something to that effect. So uh, I would definitely uh, support uh, adding that particular uh, holiday. Uh, to, to our schedule, um, and I think that's all I have at this time. Uh, Council Member Stanky, you're next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would just make a suggestion, don't know whether it's a good one or a bad one, uh, although when we look at the volunteer hours and whether they actually are provided or not, um, rather than it being a penalty, uh, maybe look at it more as a reward uh, from the standpoint that most of the 501c3s are not hand to mouth. They do have some reserves. And um, what they could do is they could um, actually provide an escrow, if you would, um, where we monetize the value of those volunteer hours. And so when, they, when, when the event gets put together, they, uh, they post, if you will, an escrow amount that when those volunteer hours are logged, they receive that back. Um, so rather than be a penalty that we go chasing after something that wasn't uh, fulfilled, instead we have a, a deposit, so to speak, that's returned to them when those volunteer hours are provided. Okay. Just a thought. Council Member Cummings. Yeah, thank you. Um, kind of like what the mayor was saying, saying, I'm in agreement with him. You know, there's a lot of 501c3s out there. My question is, is how are you choosing who, who you're picking on helping with sponsorship? That was my great concern, and that's why I feel like okay. some people that are left out, it's kind of not fair to them. If it's you know dear to someone's heart, like uh, autism or cancer, and we don't sponsor them, but we're sponsoring you know uh, this category over here. So how how have you guys been that's choosing a, in the that's past? That's a great question. So usually the 51C3 approaches us, and they're looking for the support from the city. And then they go through the partnership agreement paperwork that then gets goes through the approval process through our uh, Parks and Recreation Department and sometimes all the way up to the city manager's level for that level of support that we want to do. As I said before, most support is well under 10000 Most of it's under $5,000 in actual asset value cost. Having said that, though, um, they approach us. And we don't. If, if they approach us, they give us good reason. They have a good proposal in their partnership agreement. I don't think we've ever turned one down in any way, shape, or form. Because it's a little bit of assistance in planning, but it's mainly moving assets out there for them to utilize for the activity or the event, and then we pull the assets back. You know, I just look at, we have so many holidays in a year where we can do a lot of celebrations through the month. Um, that's why I just, I was just looking at, if it's not a holiday, why are we putting the dollars into it? Um, but you've made some valid points, uh, Mayor Gunter. And um, I just, uh, you know, I, I think it's great that we're going to be stepping up with more celebrations in the city, which is going to be good, more f family events happening. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, we just have to be very careful on the nonprofits, on who we're choosing. So thank you. For, for clarification, Mayor, too, uh, we've never supported a quote unquote private event. All the events that do get the supported level support in the 501c3s are for public, 
and the entire city is welcome to those events. There's no private events that have a delineated invitation or private only. That would not get city supported event. Right. That would not get city supported assets. Todd, do we do we have a problem with adding that to our definition? We do not. The the other thing too is, uh, you know, when it comes to the CRA and their contribution, uh, especially to their area, you know, because that's what they're concerned with promoting uh, the CRA district. Um, I guess this question would be for the city manager slash executive director of the CRA. Um, would it be beneficial uh, for the CRA to allocate a budgetary number on a yearly basis that they want to contribute? So in other words, you know, for an argument's sake, say they want to contribute $50,000 for special events in the CRA and the city wants to contribute 50000 or whatever that number is for uh, other events as well. Not saying that we can't participate in the CRA district as well. Do we want to stick that all under one umbrella? Uh, or do you think it's better just to define the policy and the criteria and whomever organization, whether it's the city or the CRA, as long as we're following that criteria, we can move forward in that fashion? What's, what's your opinion on that? Well, my opinion is whatever the city sets as a special event criteria, um, the CRA, it has to follow. So, you know, they're, they're like any other uh, event or you know organization if they if the CRA wants to uh, put forward an event uh, they would have to come forward and work with uh, city staff to to put forward that event as far as the budget amount goes um, they set their budget um, independently uh, it comes before you all for um, you know kind of review and uh, is Maureen Maureen in the back you want to come up and talk about um, the CRA uh, special event budget and, and amount what they've set. Yeah, and, they and, and real quickly before she uh, makes her comments. And the reason that I asked that question, you know, I think one of our our goals here is to get as many events a year as we can um, for the community. And I think there may be some instances where the city uh, supports a particular event. And then that same event and correct me if I'm wrong, Todd, uh, that same uh, event, they may go to the CRA and say, hey, we need X amount of dollars for X, Y, or Z. So it's almost like they're double dipping. Uh, in the event, does that ever occur? Yeah, so uh, in review, in the grant program we put together, our, our support will be outside of the CRA. If, if they would like support from in, inside the CRA for that grant, we are addressing, we do not want to do the double dip. We want to make sure that the grant is associated with the CRA because the event's in the CRA, but then we want to provide support any other events outside of the CRA through our, our program, if that was clear. All right. Maureen Weiss, assistant to the city manager. The CRA has set aside $90,000 a year to support um, special events in the CRA district. That um, program, they, they recently made some modifications to their program one of the requirements is that the event is open to the entire um, public, of course, that it takes place in the CRA district. And they now have two application periods each year um, for nonprofits to apply for sponsorship. The sponsorships that they provide are a maximum of $5,000 per event, if that answers your question. Thank you, Council Member Shepard. Yes, yeah, so if you answered my question, I just wanted to make sure that there was a limit which I see there is, and uh, um, we're not double dipping because I want to add more events if possible. Thank you. Yeah, and I think once, uh, you know, whatever the criteria that we set, then everyone abides by the, the exact criteria, no matter how they go about to get that additional funding for their particular. In the partnership agreement, there's pretty specific criteria. I think you guys have a copy of that that outlines how they qualify, what the limitations are in that agreement itself. And I think additionally, uh, the budget budgetary process, and, and not necessarily that we can't add at a later time, but as a part of the budgetary uh, process, when we are uh, identifying uh, the dollar amounts, I think it would be important to make sure we note exactly, uh, like we kind of have here, 
exactly which um, events that we are going to participate in uh, for that particular year. Uh, and not saying that there's not a, an additional mechanism in place where someone can't walk through the door after the budget is approved and say, hey, I'd like to be, you know, either a, a city sponsored event and a mechanism in place for them to go ahead and apply for it, as long as there's budgetary dollars that are left over. Uh, because if, you know, if we're putting $5,000 per event and you come to us and you say, okay, I have 10 events, we know that's $50,000. Uh, so we've pretty much eaten up that aspect of the, of the budget. So, uh, you know, that, that would probably be helpful in the budget uh, discussions as well. Any other uh, comments? Mr. Mayor, I think of, we're gonna, we can go ahead and add in the open to all, all the public. You know, that's something that we already have kind of, it was just unwritten, so we'll add that to the, the yep. city supported events. And when you say open to the public, that's a little different than an event that the community as a whole can participate in. Same thing. I think we're saying the same thing. Okay. I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, slice words or, or mix words there. Okay. Um, I, I would like to know if there, I've heard two council members that uh, want to add a Memorial Day event for next year. So before we leave today, uh, in preparation for the budget, I'd just like to kind of hear from the rest if that's a, a something that you'd like added. Okay. Council member Steinke. Yeah, I mean, that's what my intent was, you know, if I, you know, Black Lives Matters, a white, you know, supremacy group wants to come in, things of that. The way I see that, that doesn't fit the criteria of an event that the community as a whole can participate in. And I think that's very important in, in the criteria that you need to meet. Um, as long as everyone in the community, uh, no matter if it's a child, a teenager, or an adult, can go down and participate in, uh, if that can happen, Hey, great. Uh, if for some reason that can't happen for whatever reason, um, then it may not fit the criteria of a city supported event. Can, can, can we just there, have a. There will be some constitutional issues. Yeah, I know. That, so, right. Yeah. All right. right. Anything else, Council Members? Thank you. All right, Council Member Hayden. Concerns. That's why I said holidays only. Yep. Council be Member careful Hayden. on this stuff. Um, Council Member Hayden has the floor oh, then. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, yeah, I, I don't mind looking at a Memorial Day event. I just want us to work in partnership with Chuck Warren's event at Coral Ridge. Yeah. I would hate to have anything interfere with what he, that tremendous event that he puts out there every year that uh, brings people together to honor the, the fallen. Yeah. Um, and I can't think of any event on the list that doesn't uh, or wouldn't include uh, the public and, and the in any shape or form. So all the events on there, um, I think, provide uh, uh, an attraction uh, uh, for the community to attend and, uh, and get enjoyment out of. Um, so, but um, more, yeah, um, MLK is not a bad thought. Um, I know Fort Myers um, puts on a, a walk every year downtown that attracts a lot of people, but um, in order priority I'd probably put Memorial Day first because of the significance of the day and then uh, you know, maybe in the future we look at we look at MLK thank you 
Go ahead, Council Member Cummings. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Councilman Hayden. <laughs> um, I have a question for you. What were the, the, the um, holidays we were not celebrating as of right now? It was... Todd, you want to put up the slide? Yep. I have an expert here, Maureen. Uh, except I don't know where they put the presentation, so... <laughs> well, I'll, I'll read them off. Yeah. It's uh, Martin Luther King Day, President's Day, Memorial Day, Juneteenth, Labor Day, and Columbus Day. Yeah, and those are pretty important, if you ask me. <coughs> I do have a request that's not on there, and, I, and it's very important to me, and I know to many, many people here in the city of Cape Coral, is Purple Heart Day. Um, we are the city that represents the Purple Heart, and I've noticed that we have not done anything the last several years for the men and women that were wounded, that have served for our country. Can we add that to the list? I feel like that's very important. Do we know when that Purple Heart Day is? Uh, is it in October? Hold on, I'll tell you. August 7th, 2023. When? August 7th. Yeah, August, August 7th. 7th. Council Member Cosden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I like the idea of a Memorial Day ceremony, but I also kind of paused because the ceremony at Coral Ridge is so big. Yesterday, he said it was, I think, the 42nd annual. He's been doing it for years. So I just want to be careful and make sure we're coordinating with them if we're gonna do this. Um, it's a great ceremony, maybe we can learn from them. Um, talking about the um, events and making sure they're open to all, I just wanna be careful there. Um, I've been to most of these events and of course they're open to the public, but I think we're on thin ice by using that language as we talk about it. Because if you look at the list, there are events on here that you could argue are not open to the public for example, the menorah and tree lighting, if you do not celebrate Hanukkah or Christmas, are you not therefore included in that event? I'm saying this kind of facetiously because it's a great event. I went there, I love it, but I just wanna be careful with how we're talking about these events. Um, it, it sounds like it would be a subjective decision to decide whether something is truly open to the public. And then my question would be who would determine that? I would assume not staff because it's so subjective. And then would we as a council and how would that work? So, um, and I also love the idea of the Purple Heart Day. My husband's a Purple Heart, and I think it would be great to recognize these people. Thank you. Yeah, when you talk about the uh, Memorial Day, it would be nice if we could try to uh, incorporate, like you said, I uh, uh, participated uh, this weekend, uh, and I have for several years at the Coral Ridge Cemetery. You know, even if we did something on I know it's kind of out of the norm, but because uh, that particular facility puts on a great uh, a Memorial Day service, we've been doing it for 42 years, even if we could have uh, some type of uh, program where we shut down Jakita, uh, which is right next, right next to the, uh, you know, the event where maybe had some food trucks or some type of, some type of event up there that maybe after the service that the community could walk over to, uh, you know, that may be a possibility. I know we, we like to have our events downtown, but uh, it's just a thought. That way you don't lose the people that are there already for the, uh, for mm -hmm. the event. So I just thought I would uh, throw that out there as well. I think I have a good direction on the Memorial Day event. Uh, make sure we coordinate it with Coral Ridge. We'll look to put uh, some type of remembrance ceremony together uh, for uh, at the city. Um, and then as far as the... Um, an, an event that the community as a whole can attend. <clears throat> Essentially what we're gonna do there <clears throat> is just make sure that there's no screening criteria to enter. I mean, that's, that's really what we're saying is that you don't have to meet some type of criteria to be eligible to, to attend the event. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
All right, I think, uh, why don't we take a 10 minute break before we uh, get into uh, item three on the agenda. So we'll come back at 11.20.
All right, I'll call the meeting back to order. Uh, we'll move on to item 4B3, uh, protection of the public water system ordinance uh, update. Uh, Mr. City Manager. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, Department Head uh, Jeff Pearson is going to uh, present the protection of water, public water system. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Jeff Pearson, Utilities Director. I have a brief presentation for you on our backflow ordinance, um, some needed updates. First of all, I'd like to talk about uh, these backflow devices. Um, they are required by law. Uh, they are re also required in local plumbing codes and state plumbing codes. Um, the EPA, the FDEP, uh, all hold local water supply suppliers responsible for maintaining um, you know the water the public water supply in a safe manner um, and <clears throat> there's a picture here of a of a particular backflow prevention device uh, usually sometimes they are on fire lines they're on the domestic water supply um, in the city of Cape Coral, we do regulate commercial and multifamily property backflow prevention devices. Um, the current program that we have now <clears throat> requires, of uh, course, uh, a plumbing permit for the initial installation uh, if there's any re relocation of that backflow prevention device or replacement of the backflow preventer. You have to have a permit. Uh, we also require an annual inspection by a certified backflow inspector, an annual test of the backflow prevention device by a certified uh, backflow tester, and timely repair of a faulty backflow prevention device. Um, how can you tell if you have a backflow event? Um, some of the things that can happen are that you uh, lawn or pull chem chemicals can say they're in a in a in a uh, container can back with a with a hose can actually back siphon through a garden hose into the plumbing and potentially into the water distribution system. There's a uh, a graphic uh, that shows how this happens. Uh, this can mainly happens when water pressure is reduced because of a uh, water main break. It can actually reverse uh, the flow because normally uh, water flows in one direction. That's how you want it. You don't want it to flow in both directions and that's what backflow preventers um, do. They provide protection from uh, things also like uh, back siphonage of water from a toilet uh, carbonated water from a restaurant soda dispenser can uh, enter the system. Back siphonage of chemicals from industrial buildings into distribution water system mains. Some of the technologies that we use to prevent backflow are air gap, uh, reduced pressure zone, double check valve, pressure vacuum breaker, and atmospheric vacuum breakers. And the graphic provided shows what those devices look like. Some of the key ordinance changes. Uh, originally, this ordinance was adopted back in 93. Uh, most utilities around the country in the early 90s, in order to comply with the Clean Water Act, um, had to develop ordinances and start um, uh, having, you know, making sure that um, high uh, probability, high risk uh, properties are in compliance, such as uh, commercial and multifamily. And uh, it was pretty much an unfunded mandate when it came down uh, from the federal government down to the states. And <clears throat> what they require is that the local water provider has to enforce it. 
And <clears throat> what we are presenting here is to get closer to 100% compliance, if not 100% compliance. Because right now, the current, the way the ordinance uh, is that uh, we pretty much, um, we, we have a company, it's called BSI Online, who sends letters out and reminds the customers that they need to go out and hire a private company to come and do the inspections, the testing, and any repairs. Um, if they don't comply, we send more letters letting them know. And, um, <clears throat> but what we don't have right now is the flexibility to have a company um, that we could go out, get bids. Uh, right now we have about a little over 6,200 backflow prevention devices that we have to um, regulate, if you will, as a utility. And if we were, if we had the flexibility to uh, bid out a contract and the, the customer would have the option of, of allowing us to use, uh, you know, pre-qualified contractor that has bid, given us prices, we could show them the prices, and then how we would manage that is this company pretty much, uh, these companies now um, pretty much manage the entire program for us rather than having staff going out, because you can just imagine 6,200 uh, every year, year after year, going out and uh, doing these inspections, having uh, qualified personnel to go out and inspect them and to do the maintenance uh, that's required could be quite expensive um, on all of our utility rate payers. Whereas if we were to hire a private company, um, we could come in, we would give them that option. This ordinance does not change property owners' ability to hire their own private company to do annual testing and make repairs. This would allow us, we could actually put it on their utility bill and bill them over 12 months uh, rather than it be in one big hit. Right now, our only enforcement mechanism is to shut off the water. So you can imagine if we go out and we turn off commercial businesses and multifamily residential um, and they, we turn the water off, we say, you know, we've told you and we've told you, we've sent letter after letter and you are not complying. Um, our only recourse now is to shut the water off, which um, would not be a good situation. Um, so <clears throat> right now we are at about 60 to 70% uh, compliance in that range. It fluctuates from year to year. Over the past year, um, we we're a little over 60% compliance. Some people do comply. However, unfortunately, there are some that refuse to comply. And those are the ones, that 30 to 40% are the ones that we need to get in compliance. A lot of folks really don't want to the hassle. They don't want to have to manage something that they really don't even understand, that they don't uh, have the, the background in how these things work and what the requirements are. Um, so if we, the city, had the ability to, to have this private contractor do all the work for them, turnkey, uh, this would relieve them of that responsibility. They're still gonna have to pay to get these done, whether we turn the water off or not. Um, but this way, it would eliminate, it would achieve 100% compliance, and it would allow the city to um, get an economy of scale bid for all the customers that are choose not to be in compliance and choose to um, ignore our letters. Um, 
And also the ordinance changes require that um, if they do choose to do their own contractor, uh, they would have 45 days after we've noticed them to comply. And if they didn't comply, we would hire, we would tell the, the city's contractor to go, out, go in and do the work for them. And then we would put it on their utility bill. Um, we also, for some housekeeping changes, the health department used to regulate the potable drinking water supply. Uh, they used to permit everything, water mains, everything, backflow. Um, that has changed in the past year to the DEP. They've taken over that responsibility, so we need to change that. And so basically, um, this ordinance is going to help us to achieve 100% compliance. It's going to provide our commercial businesses and multifamily uh, economy of scale bid um, because rather than one bid from you know a plumbing contractor that does backflow prevention devices um, that could just charge them whatever they want, we'll have a bid schedule and we'll be able to show them here's the bid schedule if if you would like to use the city's contractor. If not, you can use your own. You have 45 days to comply. And if you don't, we will turn the water off uh, as a last resort. Um, but this is something that um, many cities in the state of Florida have struggled with uh, that have utilities uh, that are tasked with uh, managing a backflow prevention program and this uh, I believe this ordinance uh, gives us a lot more flexibility and a lot more options uh, to achieve 100% compliance uh, this is a very important issue um, because one event where somebody has a garden hose and a bucket of chemicals we have a main break you know a block away or wherever that causes back pressure and they, if they do not have proper backflow prevention on that, their system and they draw chemicals into our system, it could, be, it could result in um, you know, potentially millions of dollars in lawsuits. It could, it could result, it's have some very adverse consequences. So it's very important that we um, uh, continue to um, uh, manage this program and do it in an efficient way that I think is in the best interest of our citizens and the city. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'll jump in here first. I got two questions and I'll give my comments. Um, first question would be uh, how much is uh, an inspection going to cost? Well, it'll depend on, Mayor, it'll depend on what the bid comes in at. I know we looked, um, the uh, facilities looked at uh, got some bids recently, and they range for domestic water, I think it's $75, and for fire lines, it was $150. But if we, that was only for about 90 backflow preventers. Uh, I would imagine if we go out, we put this on the street, as a 6,000, potentially up to 6,200 backflow prevention devices that would be annually inspected, tested, and or repaired if needed, I think those costs could come down probably to the, you know, for a domestic water, potentially 50, 55, $60 range. All right, and my next question is, we do a test and it's not working properly, it needs to be repaired. Who's doing a repair? Um, well, the customers require, it's, these are all private devices, mm -hmm. so either the customer hires their own plumbing contractor that has backflow prevention certification, and they do it, or if, they, if the adoption of this ordinance moves forward, the city would have a bid schedule that provides the prices 
of what that would cost. And it really varies on the size of the backflow prevention device, what's wrong with it. Uh, there's a lot of variables. Um, the numbers I've seen for uh, repairs could range between um, three, four, three or four hundred up to about twelve hundred dollars per device, depending on the size. Of course, the larger the size backflow prevention uh, device or assembly, uh, the higher the price usually because there's a lot more um, components that have to potentially be replaced. Okay, so if we're talking, we have a, just 30% of uh, the 6,200 that uh, have not got the uh, proper inspection done on a yearly basis, correct? Yes, this is a yearly annual basis. basis. Um, that's 18, 1,860 uh, units out of the 6,200. Um, I'll tell you some of the concerns that I have. I, I wouldn't support this ordinance, and I'll tell you why. Um, first off, I do not think <clears throat> it's in local government's responsibility to go out and do these repairs for these uh, particular businesses. And I'll give you some other examples. You know, I know uh, commercial structures uh, here in our city have yearly fire safety inspections. Does that mean if they don't comply to the fire safety regulations that we're going to do that for them and then charge them? Fire suppression systems throughout our city, it's the same thing, have to have yearly inspections. Does that, does that mean that we're going to do the inspection and if they're not uh, in compliant, we're going to do the repair? Elevators in our city have to be uh, I think theirs is every two years, have to be uh, inspected. Does that mean that we're going to do the repairs if, if the elevators uh, aren't working uh, or meet the state uh, code? And uh, are, we, are we going to do those repairs? As a business owner, some of these businesses that you talk about, as a business owner myself, I have responsibilities and obligations that I have to meet, whether I like them or not. And for our city, a local government, to go out and do these repairs because someone else doesn't want to do them, uh, I don't agree with. That's not what I think our tax dollars should be used for. I think that uh, it's their responsibility to be compliant. I would focus more on the compliance and the restrictions. I have no problem if we want to get a company out there to get a bid and go to the uh, person who hasn't submitted uh, the yearly inspection and say you have two choices, or actually three. You can hire your own, or the city has taken it upon itself to get a bid from a, from a local vendor that'll come out and do the inspection, and this is how much it's gonna cost you. There are your two options. The third option is we're going to turn your water off. I promise you, if you go out and turn your water off, they're going to be compliant, just like me. I have in my business, I need to have workers' comp, I have to have liability insurance, and a multitude of other, and every two years renew my license. Um, if I don't do that and I don't meet that criteria, I'm not in business anymore. So I don't think it is the responsibility of the city to do the repairs. I have no problem trying to make it easier for them to develop a program or some uh, dollar amounts that we can provide for them. Uh, but for us to go out and, and do the yearly testing, to do the repairs on top of that, to me, that's not the function of local government. So um, that's my opinion on it. If I may, Mayor, we would not be doing this, the inspections, the testing and repairs. That would be a private contractor. I understand Just that, like but who's saying, paying it? Who's paying for it? The customers would ultimately who's are paying responsible. For it in the, beginning? the the city would not be paying. F well, the city would have to pay the contractor, but we would recoup those costs through the water bill. Yeah, over, over twelve over months. You said a twelve-month period, and see, that's where I disagree with you. First, I don't think that we should be incurring the cost at all. And secondly, we surely shouldn't be. I wish in my business I could have the city come out 
and do something for me and I could offset that expense for, for 12 months. Hey, where do I get in mind for that? I'll sign up today for it. So I just don't, I don't agree with the program. I agree that we should maybe uh, look to an outside vendor to get some pricing to help those customers become compliant, but I don't think it's our responsibility to do the inspection, to do the repairs, and use our tax dollars to do that. That's that particular business is a responsibility. If you don't want to do that, shut your doors. So that's how I, I feel on it. Uh, the next person, uh, Council Member Steinke. Thank you. Um, Jeff, just a couple questions and a, and a final comment. Uh, first question is, do other municipalities have the same issue where uh, the residents as well as multifamily dwellings and commercial buildings have these backflow arresters and um, is this a way that they handle it? Yes, absolutely. Um, they have the same issues we're encountering where uh, probably statewide in the state of Florida, there's only about a 70% compliance. Um, they, a lot of other cities have the same type of online program where the plumbers, private plumbers that the private property owners engage, um, they do the inspection, the testing, and if necessary, any repairs, and then they have to pay $15, I believe it is, to an online system to uh, submit all the proper documentation that's saying that they're in compliance. Uh, that's how our system works now. A lot of cities are using the same system, um, and a lot of cities are finding that system is not very efficient. Uh, it's causing, you know, a higher percentage of noncompliance. Um, if we had the ability to go out and get an economy of scale bid, we could show the private citizens here's the bids, if you want to go out, pay, use our contractor, uh, you can, and they, can, they don't have to put it on the utility bill. That's just something that I put on there. We could actually take that out if that's not um, acceptable. That's something, or we could say, you know what, we're just going in your next bill, we're gonna charge you the full amount. So it would be a matter of you know, the contractor going out because they're non-compliant um, and doing the, you know, testing, repairs, inspection, and then we just charge the customer the full amount of what it costs. It's not costing the utility any money other than, um, you know, for the ones that are not um, compliant, and then we get our money back in the next bill cycle, the next month. Okay, and uh, the other question uh, is, where are these devices normally located on the property? Usually they're located outside. Um, you'll see a device coming up out of the ground, like on the presentation. Um, on this slide, uh, if they could pull that up on the right there on that picture. So it's not, usually invasion, look like it's that. not an invasion to their privacy, so to speak, for any length of time for this to be done. No, it can all be done, you know, probably nine times out of 10 outside the building. Um, and they don't even know that it's happening unless they see somebody out there uh, running, you know, doing the inspection and testing. Cause these, um, these prevention devices, these kind of assemblies to um, allow testing without turning the water off or anything like that. So, um, you know, there's no interruption in service or anything like that. It's just, it's done and then they move on to the next one. Okay, thank you. And then uh, my last question before my final comment is um, almost 2,000 people isn't like a rogue uh, you know, one or one or two, uh, it's a, a large number of people. What's the why? What's the general why that they don't comply? Probably cost. Uh, some of them we believe actually could be 
getting their uh, certificate, getting a plumber out there and inspecting it, but they're not paying the $15 to, um, to the company that we hired to manage it, which is BSI Online. Um, so, you know, but we don't know that because they're not, you know, the, whoever they've hired is not following through with the final step. Okay, um, I, and my final comment, and thank you for the, the answers to those questions, is uh, I agree with the mayor. I don't think that we should uh, be using uh, taxpayer dollars, if you will, uh, to deal with those that are um, non-compliant when it's as simple as turning off their potable water until they do. I am, I am in support of establishing an approved source and making it easy for them to comply. If there's anything that we can do to make it easier, whether it's uh, in that final reporting of the work that was done or, or giving the directions on you know, who to contact uh, to do what, if we can be a service um, uh, to the public at any time, I'm in, I'm in favor of that. Um, but I'm not in favor of using the dollars of the compliant uh, to support the non-compliant uh, when it's as easy as if you don't comply, we'll turn off your water until you do. Um, it seems like a simple enough process. It seems like it's easy access to get it done. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's where I'll stand. Here. Well, I'd like to correct something. Um, we are required to enforce this. We do spend money on BSI online. That is not free. I think it runs about 30, 40 grand a year that we have to pay that company to manage this for us. Otherwise, we would have to do it in-house. We have to enforce it. There's no way around it. We, we either pay a company to manage the, the program or we bring it in-house and we pay our employees to manage it, but we have to enforce it. And what this ordinance is doing is basically just making it more flexible uh, for our citizens to actually have a company because here's a scenario say we've got a multifamily uh, property with 300 homes you know buildings served on one backflow preventer if I go out there I turn that off and they have no clue what a backflow preventer is or who to call or anything else um, they're gonna have to hire somebody immediately that contractor is probably going to charge them a lot of money to come out there in the middle of the night or middle of the day when they're working on some other project to to fix it and to be back into compliance which could take potentially more than 24 or 48 hours or might maybe even 72 hours or longer and during that time, 300 residences have no water. I absolutely, so, I absolutely understand. I absolutely understand. And um, I'm not saying that we don't invest the money for the management of the requirement. I, we either got to pay for it inside or we pay for it outside. I get right. that. So since we're um, uh, responsible for um, you know, expecting and managing the compliance, I get it. So I'm not talking about money for that. I'm talking about where it says the city and its agents shall have the authority to hire a licensed plumbing contractor to test, inspect, install, and repair all backflow prevention devices that are regulated by, the, by this article. Um, that's, those are the dollars that I'm not in, a, in agreement that we should have to spend those um, or invest those with thought of future return of those dollars when I'm sure that those 300 homes and whoever's responsible for them has been given adequate notice before that step would ever be taken, before the water is turned off, I'm sure that there is constructive receipt of some notification of the letter that says this has to be done and has to be provided. If they continue to ignore that, then they bring on their, their own grief. So um, the citizens are responsible some citizens are irresponsible. And I don't think that, that we should be paying for those things that others agree to pay for themselves and comply with the things that need to be complied with 
you know, it's, it, it's a systemic issue in our society, people just not taking personal responsibility for what they should be responsible for. So that, that's the piece of it that I, that I don't like, is that if you don't comply, then we're gonna come in and invest our money to, to um, comply for you so that we don't turn your water off. It's, that's, that's just where I am. Well, what we could do is make it where um, we get a bid and um, we say, here's, here's a, an economy of scale bid and you can use this, no cost to the city, um, or get your own, which the ordinance allows still, their own private company, and if they don't comply, which the prior ordinance didn't really have a deadline, it just says, you know, reasonable amount of time, will, you know, what is a reasonable amount of time? So I believe, you know, we could have it 30 days. I've got 45 days in here, which is more than I believe is reasonable to hire somebody or to use our list and you have to comply and you have to pay to for that service but my only goal here is to get 100 percent compliance and i just want to make sure that before i go out and start turning these people off that everybody knows that this ordinance exists and we'll certainly do that um, because they've been noticed they've gotten three letters and we're at the point where we can go out and turn those, turn them off right now. Um, they've been noticed, but I was thinking that there might be a better way, and the better way is contained in the ordinance. Council Member Shepherd. Yes. Uh, put it out there, out there a little differently. Uh, I have a business that has uh, three of these meters, back, backflow uh, preventers. And uh, it's not in the city of Cape Coral. So it's not our city, it's not our water company, it's a different uh, water provider. But I'm gonna tell you what I go through as a business. I get the letter, it tells me it's time to get my backflow preventers recertified. And I call all the plumbers in the area and tell them I need that handled. And with the building boom that we've had in the last few years and the hurricane, none of the plumbers are interested because they have other work out there where they can make a lot more money. And the majority of them don't even call you back. So the water company uh, uh, that, that provides me water, what they went and did on their own was me an approved vendor list. They went out and hunted down plumbers and said, hey, do you want to specialize in this? And we'll feed your work. With that, give us a, an exact rate. So I'll tell you what my rate was. My rate for, for the meter size I had, which was the same meter size as a Cape Coral home, was 100 bucks. So the water company would say, at first, they would say, uh, they would call me and say, you didn't get it done yet. You're running out of time. When are you going to get it done? And I would tell them, I can't find a plumber to do it. And I'd be in a panic because I don't want my water turned off. And they would say, well, we have an approved vendor list that you can call. And these guys, this is all they do. And that worked for a little while. Then we got into this building boom and, and, and this storm. And now I'm dealing with it right now. The approved vendor isn't interested because he's making bigger bucks, doing bigger jobs. So I don't think every situation is someone just not wanting to be responsible. I think there's a problem out there. Well, people can't get the service. It's not available. It's just not available. So I think what the city can maybe do is do an approved vendor maybe looked for companies that want to specialize in it, where they have a mechanic that just does that. So they're not tied up with the other work that's pulling them away. 
and maybe the city adds a small fee for that service. And I can tell you right now, I'd rather have, as a business, a water provider telling me, listen, if you exhausted all possibilities, we have a list, and this is the preset fee. And if the city gets a percentage for offering that service, well, the city is just not offering a service, it's offering relief because they're not turning your water off. Okay? So I think it's, 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 it's not about the city making money or taking something over. I think it's about giving a, a relief to the citizen that just has nowhere else to go. I dealt with it now. I can tell you it's not just now. I've dealt with the problem for 10 years in all different economies. There's not a lot of plumbers that are really interested in sending a truck and a man out there for a hundred dollar service unless they're slow. If they're not slow, they're not interested. The other thing that I recognize is that water company, I'm not going to put words into the mouth of, of our uh, water people here, but I can tell you that the water service I get elsewhere, what they do is they give relief by adding months to getting their job done, even though when everything's exhausted. But what are they doing? They're adding liability to all the citizens that live there on an accident happening. They're trying to help you, but they're enlarging the liability that we were just educated on. So I think the answer should be that we lobby a plumbing company, more than one, to specialize in this, that gives us a fixed number where I believe that our uh, city water company should have a small fee attached to that for offering that service. That way they're monitoring that the service is done correctly, which they would anyway, but we're giving citizens another uh, available source to get the problem taken care of. Um, they told you the numbers of how many people need to get this done. And I don't think the majority of them are just people that don't want to do what's right. I can tell you, uh, I'll tell you another story. I'm trying to get many services done at my house because of the store. And the majority of the services that I need right now at my home, I can't even get companies to call me back. Let alone say, we're too busy. I, I just go through, I, I Google what service I want and I, I just call, call eight, nine companies. The majority of the time, nobody even calls me back. I had a, an appliance that needed to be fixed in my house. I called five companies. Not one called me back. The next week, I called five more. I had one call me back, and not just call me back, did exactly what they said, showed up when they said they would show up, and fixed my appliance. I not only paid them, I tipped them, because I was so excited that a business actually responded, did the job when they said they would, and I took care of them for that. But I think part of the story here is that a lot of these citizens out there can't find someone to take care of the, of the situation. And I think that it's the city's responsibility to come up with some kind of alternative resource for when you can't find anyone. And I don't expect the taxpayers to pay for that, and that's why I believe there should be a small fee added to it. You know, if, but at the same time, if our professionals are vetting a plumbing company and encouraging them to, to, to build a company based on doing that service, you know, now we have a company that just maybe is designing themselves to do that particular job that will be more successful and this list won't be as long as it is today. So I just wanted everybody to understand, you know, I'm going through it too, and I'm, I don't want to repeat myself, but it, it is not easy, especially in this economy, to get the job done. And to simply tell someone we're going to shut your water off, we don't care if you can't find a company to show up, I don't think we're doing our job 
by putting them in that situation. I think we need to find an work on finding answers, and, and uh, I'm, I'm all for working on finding that. I don't know if the way it's presented and written right now is the perfect answer, but I think that it is our responsibility as a council to come up with a form of relief so that we're not turning someone's water off especially the, the situation where we talk about a large condo. The property m manager might be exhausting all avenues trying to get it done. And now look at a position they're in when the water gets turned off. You know, I don't think any of us, any of us would want to be put in that position. But to give them an alternative and say, hey, you know, you might pay $50 more than the going rate, but this service can be out there pretty much within a day or two. I think is a great relief that people would have no problem paying for. And I will tell you the fee I pay at my business, I pay $100 a meter to have that service done. And I'm going to tell you, I go months and the water company adds months on to their risk by giving me more time um, because they know I can't find anyone. But like I said, that adds liability to the water system and I don't think that's the proper thing that we continue to do. Thank you. Council member comment. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple questions for you. So with the protection of public water, what cities here in the state of Florida is using this as an ordinance? Um, <clears throat> Cooper City is one that I'm aware of. Um, they're over on the East Coast. Um, I'm sure there are others, but that's one that I've looked at um, in developing some of the changes in our ordinance. Um, I'm sure there are many more uh, because they're running into the same issues that we are. Um, I, what I would, tr I'm trying to avert a situation where the DEP could come in and say, um, you know, you're only getting 70% compliance um, you need to do something else or, and if you don't, we're just going to give you a consent order, um, which is a fine that they would, they could levy upon us. Now, I haven't heard, heard of that happening recently, but it's something they can do, um, because it's in, uh, state statutes, um, FDEP rule. 62.555-360, um, I believe that's it, uh, is one that uh, governs uh, testing and inspections of uh, these backflow prevention devices. And um, I just, I don't want us to see us get to that point or a situation where we had a backflow event um, because unlike an elevator or fire suppression system, I mean, literally hundreds, if not thousands of people could get sick. And if that were to happen, which God forbid, you know, we could be looking at a tremendous amount of, of, of fines for not being at 100%. Uh, compliance and that's what I'm trying to do I want us to be at a hundred percent it's extremely difficult also as Councilmember Shepard mentioned about the plumbers having other work that's an issue also an issue is supply chain issues sometimes getting the parts to make repairs say the backflow prevention device is broken to get those parts could be months before you could even, or a new meter, especially the larger ones. We're seeing lead times with some of our uh, inventory items as, as, as six months to a year to getting these parts. There are companies now out there that specialize in doing the type of program that I'm um, proposing that have the parts, they have the contractors that come in and take care of it for us and charge the customer. And so really, you know, 
it was, it's something that we would have to bid out through procurement and get a company that would offer that. But again, this ordinance still allows customers to hire a private uh, plumbing or contractor, but they only have it, but it also stipulates that you have 45 days to come into compliance, and if you don't, we're gonna turn your water off. That was my next question I wanted to ask you. Have we ever had that issue take place where we had the chemical backflow when a pipe had busted where it hit the chemicals and it created contamination? None that we know of, but could it happen? Absolutely, it could happen and it could have happened and we just don't know about it. Uh, it you know, but God forbid that it would, were to happen, but we are tasked as a utility, as a city, to, to keep these people in compliance by whatever means we deem necessary. And um, for us to just shut the water off, I think it's, it could be an issue because um, some people's water could be off for potentially months if they don't have, if they can't get a contractor, if they can't get the parts. But to have something in place, uh, a company that does specializes in this type of work, not like a local plumbing contractor that most around here do not specialize in it, um, come in and manage this and charge the customer for what it costs to do the work, um, I think is, the only solution that I know of to reach that 100%. Otherwise, we're gonna continue spinning our wheels, sending them letters, um, and, you know, or we just go in and shut them off and then, you know, deal with the consequences. This um, Hooper City, did Hooper City have a problem uh, with the chemical backflow? Is this the reason why they put this ordinance in place or? Were they just having concerns like you with the growth of the city and the structure, whatever it may be, for them to put this as an ordinance? I'm sorry, Councilmember Cummings, I'm not sure what the genesis of that ordinance was, but I would, my gut tells me it was probably because they were in the same situation we are and, and most other utilities in the state of Florida where they're not getting 100% compliance. And they wanted they saw a sol potential solution and they crafted their ordinance that would allow, um, you know, this, to me, this is a benefit to our citizens, not a detriment. And I think, you know, if you probably, you, you spoke to a lot of business owners, my opinion would be they would be eager to have someone else manage it for them rather than having to you know, make all these phone calls because they're, they're focused on their core business and, and all the day-to-day -day stuff. They don't want to worry about a backflow preventer and trying to hire a contractor once a year. So really, I, I think it's a, it's a real benefit to our citizens and in the best interests of the city. Have you done a, um, a test study or did a survey of what do people think here in Cape Coral about this? No. Not the moment. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Welsh. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a couple of the things that I was going to touch on, uh, Mr. Pearson just did. Um, one of the, uh, you know, as far as fire inspector or elevator inspector, those, those two inspections are only dealing with the person's personal business or property. They're not something that's connected to an entire city utility. So I see those as things that are different, which is what Mr. Pearson said. Um, so having, you know, the ability to, we'll say, taint the water of a whole surrounding community because you're a backflow preventer, not having a fire extinguisher up to date, only my building's gonna burn down. You know, by that time, I would hope the fire department would, you know, prevent it from spreading to 20 or 30 different buildings. So. That comparison, um, I wasn't quite sure with. My other question is, is there any cost to a taxpayer that doesn't have a backflow preventer? Like a common resident, a house of my own. Would there be any cost additional to me and my taxes for doing this? 
No, single family and duplexes are not covered under the ordinance, but triplexes and above and commercial businesses are. But most of the cost associated with this is uh, going to those businesses or multi-unit directly? Most of the cost is going to be in that annual inspection and testing, which, um, like I said, if we could do a bid out, uh, an economy of scale bid for over 6,000 of these devices, potentially, um, that could be this contractor would have to do, that's a lot of work, uh, each year. Um, they, I think that the price will come down than the average property owner would get on the street. And they would have peace of mind that it's going to get done and they just cut a check. Yeah, I, I do see that and I do see the, the benefit added to our businesses and, and multifamily because now they don't have to worry about it. And us as a city don't have to worry about as much as the compliance as well. So knowing that there is no additional cost to a, a regular everyday resident or citizen um, kind of you know makes me really like this what it does is it adds another service uh, provided as a you know business owner if i didn't or as uh, council member shepherd said if you didn't have to worry about calling 30 plumbing companies to come out and do a hundred dollar service if there was one that was already contracted with the with the city or municipality that he gets his water from uh, and you knew it would just be done um, and getting that compliance i think is good my only thought would be maybe switching from billing it out over 12 months as the mayor stated we're not a finance company for things like that so maybe um, I know you've got your set times with if you need to come into compliance but maybe just put it on the next month's bill like one month instead of doing that 12 month of financing for for it but um, I, I do agree with the concept I like with what we're trying to do is provide another service uh, where our service is needed. Um, and I don't think that with what we're really arguing about as far as someone or a um, business having to pay to have it fixed, I think having it fixed is, is better for the utility department themselves to get that compliance. So thank you. Hey, Council Member Hayden. Yeah, I think we're way past the days of saying it can't happen to us. Um, I certainly don't want to run the risk of a contaminated water supply that will cost, uh, could cost us millions of tax dollars as opposed to this, which wouldn't cost near that amount. I like the flexibility of the ordinance. Um, before you said it, I completely agree with uh, Council Member Wells. I don't want to make this convenient for the person that's out of compliance. Send them the bill. You know, they, they've got to pay the bill on that first on that first statement. Take the 45 days down to 30, and uh, you know if if we're going to get into compliance to uh, lessen the risk of uh, a horrific event in our city with uh, a contaminated water supply, um, I think this provides us the opportunity to be able to fix it right away. Shutting somebody somebody's water off just increases the risk of that backflow um, problem. So. Um, you know, those would be my recommendations. Uh, they pay the bill right away and take it down to 30 days. Thank you. Council Member Steinke. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll continue uh, evidence of uh, a term of endearment that's been given to me and that is uh, uh, as a flipper. I prefer uh, instead <laughs> than to be considered a flipper, I concern, I I'd rather be uh, uh, considered an open-minded person. And so, um, uh, certainly, Council Member Shepard's uh, remarks ring true uh, uh, for me and in, in uh, businesses I'm involved with as well. Uh, the ability to get uh, contractors uh, and professionals to do work nowadays is not an easy task. Certainly, an economy of scale um, would uh, uh, afford a company, uh, a dedicated individual to that. Um, it would uh, certainly uh, assist with pricing. Uh, for those that need the service uh, and uh, in agreement with council member Welsh um, if it's a, if it's a service that uh, that has to be accomplished and then paid for uh, if an ordinary citizen 
uh, contracts for it, they'll have to write out the check to that person that came out and did it, just like if the city ended up uh, getting involved, they need to get the check right then too. So um, I, I can, uh, to afford 100% uh, compliance, uh, if in fact uh, the city were to establish uh, a, a contractor or a, a variety of contractors that could be contacted for the service and the expectation was there to get the job done within X amount of time for a given price. Uh, if the citizen didn't arrange for that themselves within the amount of time that would be required for that to be done, um, then I can see where the city uh, with this ordinance uh, could take the action and contract with that uh, um, uh, entity, uh, as a city to get the job done. And then I would agree with uh, Council Member Shepard that we add on a fee uh, for having to do that ourselves uh, for them. So it would be the actual uh, cost of the event and then uh, an additional fee because we had to do it uh, uh, with, with the uh, citizen or property owner not doing it uh, themselves. So if, if those were the, if those, uh, were the changes, that uh, it would not be a 12-month uh, repayment plan, but on their next bill uh, that they would have to pony up, uh, and that we would add an additional fee if we were the ones that had to contract to go out and get that done after a period in time, a reasonable period in time, and I think the 45 days is, is plenty of time if we have an established contractor that can go out and get the job done. So um, I, I would be okay if we made those changes. Council Member Shepard. I agree, I'm not for the financing part. Um, I did have a situation a few years back where I did find a plumber and a part was needed. And the frustration of that plumber, he didn't even wanna come back. He ordered the part, it took him a month to get back to me and I had to prove to the water company that parts were ordered and it was a, it was a, it was a project. It was a lot of back and forth, which I could see as a lot of wasted time for your staff with the back and forth. Also, uh, uh, I don't know exactly when this started, but I know that most homes, maybe you could uh, give the, the accurate information, have backflow preventers on their hose bibs so that if they put their hose in their pool, you don't have to worry about the, the backflow. There's a backflow preventer on the, on the hose bib on residential homes. I don't know if that's all the homes in Cape Coral or that started at a certain time, but I just wanted to get that out there that residential homes have a form of backflow where it's a vulnerable situation like laying a hose in a pool or on the, in, on the ground where there's animal feces, maybe things like that. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other lights. You get the direction you're looking for, Mr. City Manager. Well, I think we, I think we have um, enough consensus there. I realize there's only uh, seven council members here to move forward. Uh, and it seems like amongst those that wanna move forward, um, there needs to be some administrative uh, cost recovery on top of that. So um, when, we, when we do come back with this, there'll be some tweaks. Um, and then obviously there'll be a, a full council, so there'll be a different majority required for it to pass at, at that time. I just want to point that out that, you know, four is a consensus today, but when it comes, comes back before a vote, it would, it would need to be five unless there's seven members sitting there. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next item, the discussion. Item four is the Yacht Club Ballroom. Discussion, Mr. City Manager. Thank you. 
and it seems like uh, several members of the community have uh, all of a sudden uh, taken an interest in what was discussed and decided back in January. Um, be it as it may, in addition to that um, recognition of the decision made, um, there has also been some misinterpretation of what was presented. Clearly what was presented at the Osmosis presentations are available still to this day online. It is a condition assessment of the Osmosis. There was no discussion about uh, whether or not any specific building itself. Is your mic on? Oh, I'm sorry. It is now. Okay, thank you. Start over. Start over? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. It, it, to, to summarize, uh, just to summarize, um, in January of, uh, of this year, January 26th to be specific, uh, there were several presentations given about the Yacht Club. Uh, those presentations were meant to get an overall uh, objective and uh, path forward for the city in regards to the actual park itself. Um, those two presentations, uh, one, uh, were given one was given by staff and one was given by Kinley Horn, our consultant who is uh, the design team leading the Yacht Club presentation. Uh, basically, the intent was we had a hurricane. We were planning a phase two at a future date, which included a, an, an additional restaurant, um, some demolition of uh, buildings. Uh, specifically, I was invited by one sitting council member uh, at the time uh, to discuss this at a Yacht Club town hall meeting. Um, and I did attend that and present that. But what happened was the hurricane um, in basically closing the park fast tracked what was going to be a future uh, phase two at a later date. However, um, at the time, the condition assessment that was presented to council discussed all of the existing conditions uh, that existed on the site uh, and specifically uh, in regards to the ballroom. Uh, pictures were given about structural um, components that were damaged, pipes and plumbing that were, um, you know, failing, mismatched air conditioning units, HVAC units that, you know, the, the plenums were undersized and couldn't handle the SEER ratings at the time roofs that were beyond their normal life. And then from there, the Kimley Horn presentation was given to discuss what the possibilities would be um, if, if we had the opportunity to start over. And a series of presentations were given at that time, even included within that presentation was a picture of the possibility of renovating the existing uh, ballroom, and it talked about all the elements that might go into that. So I want to make sure to the, to the media and to the public that a full condition assessment of the building was provided. Renovation was discussed, and a consensus was given to staff on how to proceed. Now, whether or not that became big enough news for the media or there was time for people to focus on that decision and direction given because a lot of people were dealing with very significant things of their own in January. But that decision has been made and staff has progressed with what the decision, what decision was given. Now, we need to, to kind of reset this narrative because there is a lot of interest in the community right now on, on the decision that was made and the and the, the path forward that city staff is, is moving forward with. None, neither me nor any of my staff can be insubordinate and reverse course on what you all told us to do. It is a significant decision. It was a decision that was made in public. There were media in the room and staff has followed uh, through with that discussion. In, in light of the attention that um, has recently been uh, given to that decision, uh, we have three presentations to today because the condition assessment has not changed. The existing condition that existed on September 27th is the same condition that exists today. 
All the pipes are still old. The roof still needs to be repaired. The windows um, and the glazing still do not meet um, current flood uh, hurricane mitigation criteria. The foundation is still cracking. The electrical uh, distribution system is still at 100% capacity. The plenums in the AC system are mismatched and, and undersized. And the, and the, the space itself uh, still is a one reservation, one function uh, type space. There's not the ability to have multiple functions uh, there today. All of those uh, elements that were given um, in January still exist. So I want to uh, have staff from Public Works present uh, in detail uh, greater um, elaborate, to elaborate in greater detail on what was presented in summary on the 26th so that you have an idea of, wh of what, that, um, what those numbers are and how they were arrived at. I want to have Development Services give a presentation on what they do regardless of a hurricane. If somebody comes in to do an improvement on a residential or commercial property, because that's the process we'd have to take in permitting uh, a renovation to the site. And then also would like to have um, Haggerty give a presentation on the 50% rule uh, as it exists so that you can understand it, it, why it's in place and um, how it plays out. So with that, I want to uh, turn this over to uh, Public Works to give their portion of the presentation and then we'll go into development services and then Haggerty. Good afternoon, Damon Grant, for the record. Um, I'm gonna take you through the Yacht Club update. Um, the Public Works team uh, put together a brief PowerPoint and it's meant for, you know, you, you've seen a lot of numbers and a lot of uh, data that's been thrown out, but to pretty much put this, uh, the intent of the uh, PowerPoint is to put it all into context, as Mike alluded to. So if we go to page one, this is a busy report. There's only about five slides. We're gonna keep it short because I know you have a one o'clock. Uh, but across the top, uh, we thought it was important for the, the council to be aware of, and we'll keep this for future storm events as well because these processes tend to follow the same. Uh, so on 422, April uh, 2022, and this is well before the storm, five months before the storm, you can see that that's where our chronology starts, not at the time of the storm. But on 422, this was back when we were doing Operation Sparkle and the parks team and public works team were getting together to take a look holistically at the maintenance issues surrounding their parks. We had, and you, you'll see that again coming to you soon in the way of the uh, park system. Uh, uh, Storm Football Burton in Northwest. But on 422, um, we elected to do a conditional assessment as part of that Operation Sparkle. And a lot of that was due to trend analysis that facilities keeps and seeing the, um, the numbers of work orders that go through, the size of the building, the age of the building. As you know, um, the Yacht Club, the ballroom is a 1962 building and represents, uh, I believe, the oldest in our inventory. Uh, so on 422, we, we, we conducted an internal uh, condition assessment, and on the page below, that talks to the, uh, the conditional assessment. I'll get into that in just a little bit, but if we can go across the top. Uh, so 422 was the conditional assessment that talked about the deferred maintenance of the building and what we saw as public works facilities and where we were lacking and th things that we think, um, for whatever reason, were pushed down the road or deferred. On 922, uh, the hurricane uh, hit. Um, shortly after uh, that 928 date, uh, several buildings were red tagged by development services. Red tag meaning that uh, they were deemed unsafe. Uh, specifically for the Yacht Club was the mechanical and electrical room that provides power to both the uh, ballroom and the Retina Center. On uh, Haggerty actually got involved. They've been with us the whole way. So those are a couple items in there that we're going to add to this chron chronology as we go along. Uh, 1022 uh, Synergy. Synergy is uh, works under your Florida Municipal Insurance Trust (FMIT). They're your project manager. They they came out and began doing damage assessments, and uh, Tetra Tech uh, was also doing assessments. Uh, in November of 22, uh, Sedgwick, which is the adjuster for FMIT, uh, began putting numbers to Synergy's report. Um, 
those uh, numbers we're going to talk about uh, in a few minutes. Then in December of 2022, we received the appraisals for both the ballroom and the Rotino Center from our property management team. On April 2023, uh, FEMA began conducting their site uh, inspection uh, process and then still to be determined is what we call DDD from FEMA, Damage Description and Dimensions. So if we can real quickly, I'll try to speed up a little bit, move forward on 422. Uh, we mentioned the conditional assessment, as you can see on that same page at the bottom, 2.545 million. That represents the MEPs, your mechanical, electrical, plumbing issues, exterior, interior um, enclosures and construction, as well as your interior finishes. So when you hear that $2.5 uh, million dollar, uh, deferred maintenance, that's uh, what we see if we would pull up for the Yacht Club specifically and look at our asset management plan or what's been deferred uh, since 1987, which was, I believe, the last major maintenance event that we had for that site, that equates to 2.5 million. Da Damon, and the, those numbers uh, on the estimated replacement cost, that was as of the 422 condition assessment, correct? Yes, sir. So that's not reflective of what it might actually cost in today's market to do the work. That, that's important and that's correct. And if the, um, and, and to just to add to that, you know, if this was deemed to be at some point in the future historical, that number for renovations would, would go up as well. Um, page two, uh, again, going across the top uh, where we can, we had the hurricane event, the next one's 1022, FMIT, again, again Florida Min Municipal Insurance Trust, Synergy, their initial overall property assessment, that's not just for the ballroom or the Martino Center, that's for every component at the Yacht Club, that's the $3.562 million number. For the ballroom specifically, uh, Synergy provided a range of damage between 20,000 and 100,000. Uh, Synergy adjusted that a month later to specifically $41,000. And then when their adjuster uh, reviewed that package for the ballroom, uh, came back with the $25,000 number. Um, we requested a validation of that number. That's when Tetra Tech uh, got involved and I think they came out and not just for the, for the Yacht Club, but for roughly 100 of our facilities, we asked Tetra Tech to come out and validate the number that we had received from FMIT's group. Uh, but as Tetra Tech reviewed the overall property uh, damage, they came back with uh, 2.7 million, specifically for the ballroom, $320,000 uh, amount. Uh, moving forward to December of 22, we received uh, from uh, Maxwell, uh, Hendry and Simmons, our, uh, let's see where we at. Uh, our appraisal value for 680,000. So let's go to the next. Okay, the next slide represents, uh, we call it by the numbers. This is the, this is the number specific to our facilities team and what we track. And if you look at the top, um, you can see the, there's a quantity and, and cost uh, numbers uh, for specifically for MVPs and general maintenance. And you can see from 2013 to 2021, kind of what those numbers represent, and they are moving up. Not so much the, uh, the quantity, but also we look at the cost. And again, a lot of times those go hand in hand with the age of the building. And that is uh, more specifically identified in the chart below. Now we get into uh, more specifically to the Yacht Club and the property appraiser. Uh, we, we thought it was important for the city to have this definition for market value, uh, the value of a building and structure, excluding the land and other improvements on the parcel. Said market value is the actual cash value in kind, replacement cost appreciated for age, wear, tear, neglect, and quality of construction, uh, determined by a qualified independent appraiser prepared within 12 months. So as we go through this next, um, group of numbers. Con construction, straightforward, 1962 with a ballroom. The Rotina Center, 1962, we did add a, two wings to the Rotina Center in 1995. You've got your gross square footages um, for both uh, facilities, the age, 
Now the effective age and remaining economic life can get a little confusing and we can ask Don to come up and explain it, but that's based on a real, uh, real estate formulas and calculations. If you have a 60 year old building, the effective age in essence is, you know, how old is that building really? You know, if you've kept really good care of yourself and, uh, and, and put it into that perspective, uh, you know, they're looking at it as a 40 year age and with the remaining economic life of four years. Now, why that doesn't jive with the Rotino Center, we can get you more information or have Don come up and explain that. Uh, I was a little confused by that myself, but that's the numbers they gave us. The reconstruction value is 3.234063 million. That represents if we were gonna go out and rebuild what exists today in the way of the, uh, the systems and what we have there in the way of assets. The market value, 680,000. We have another definition on the next slide. We can talk more sp specific to that. Your cost for square foot, $237 for the Yacht Club, 199. Again, that's based on this, um, this, uh, this presentation for this slide. If you take for under the Yacht Club, $237 per square foot, and you multiplied it by the uh, 13,657 square feet, um, that would give you your reconstruction value of 3.234. And the same for the Rotino Center. If you took the cost per square foot of $199, multiplied it by the 8,087 square feet, you would reach your reconstruction value of $1.610991 million. And this is a continuation. Um, let me see if we need to hit any of this that we haven't already talked about. This is, again, the reconstruction value and then the deferred maintenance that we discussed. Uh, and it gives you a definition of deferred maintenance. Items of wear and tear on a property that should be fixed now to protect the value or income producing ability of the property, such as broken windows, dead trees, leaks. Okay. Um, this next slide is, starts to get into the flood, uh, but this is a three-part presentation, so I know that Wyatt's going to hit this and um, uh, it's part of his piece of this puzzle. So are, are there any questions in what we presented? Again, what we were trying to do was provide the council with a chronology um, when it comes to future discussions as well as where some of these numbers uh, came from and what, and what they mean. If we need to go and dig deeper or drill down or provide any additional information to add this report, we're happy to do so. Thank you, Council. I have any uh, questions up to this point? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just to, to summarize and recap this back to January, um, all of those pictures that were taken from April of 22 were in the presentation in January. So all, all of these items, all this deferred maintenance, all of that was listed in there. What has been the focus more recently is the hurricane damage and one aspect of this, which was an inspection report of $25,000. That, that we could go fix the $25,000 and bring the building back to 927. That's not the issue that we have at play here. So what I'd like to do now is have development services come forward and talk about the real issue that we have, which is the substantial improvement and having to repair and do all this work that is that needs to be done to the building and what actions would have to be taken um, if they if we did try to pull a permit for all this work okay. good afternoon good afternoon for the record Wyatt Daltrey playing team coordinator of the city's playing division uh, talking about substantial improvement substantial damage FEMA regulations okay substantial improvement substantial damage uh, is a it's a rule that FEMA has for any community and national flood insurance program it affects properties within the special flood hazard area which are all the AE and VE zones on this map, it's every property that's identified in brown and blue, not green. Green where those properties were removed most recently from the flood map changes. Uh, the interact, there's an interaction here where basically your base regulations come from FEMA through the National Flood Insurance Program. We do a little bit extra through something called the Community Rating System called CRS, and our codes are consistent with everything within this pyramid. 
Okay, regarding substantial improvement, substantial damage, which I will refer to as SISD, just to save myself a couple breaths here. Uh, it's the FEMA 50% rule. Uh, that basically compares the market value of the improvements or the damages to a building versus the market value of that structure. Most of what you've heard, uh, particularly with Hurricane Ian in the background, has been regarding substantial damage. However, substantial improvement also has a part to play. In other words, we'd be having a iteration of this conversation regardless whether Hurricane Ian had occurred or not. Uh, this SISD pertains to structures in the special flood hazard area that are below the required base flood elevation, which is identified in FEMA's flood insurance rate maps. <clears throat> in those situations where the cost of the improvements or damages meet or exceed 50% of the market value of the structure, the 50% rule applies. Structure needs to be brought into compliance with the current floodplain requirements. That's the cities, which involves the state Florida building code as well. Some examples of substantial improvement, substantial damage uh, could be rehabilitation or remodel of a building with or without modifying the external dimensions. Uh, a lateral or vertical addition to a building, foundation repair, uh, restoration or repair of damage of any origin. It's not necessarily flood. Could be wind, could be fire, could be, you know, plane crash, automobile crash into the structure. It's just damage uh, is, is the trigger um, uh, to restore the building to the pre-damaged state. Um, most of what we've discussed to date uh, has been substantial damage for residential buildings. And for residential buildings, there's really two ways you can bring that structure back into compliance if they happen to be uh, meeting that 50% rule. And that's items A and B here. You raise the building by elevating it. Either you add fill or you add stem wall construction or a deep and modest slab to bring the finished floor elevation to the base flood elevation plus one foot. Uh, the plus one foot is a Florida building code requirement. Or you raise, as in tear down the building, to rebuild that building at the base flood elevation plus one foot. Non-residential buildings, uh, Yacht Club Ballroom, for example, have a third option, and that is to dry flood-proof the building, which involves installation of flood-proof materials, installing gates or panels for every means of egress, protecting HVAC. Uh, our requirement is actually a little bit beyond that of Florida Building Code. We require that these materials be installed to the base flood elevation plus two feet. Ultimately, at the end of the day, FEMA's perspective is if you are going, if you have a structure that's been affected uh, substantially, whether you're improving it or whether it's damaged, you need to make, as part of your repairs or remodels, you need to bring that structure into compliance so it reduces the vulnerability. For commercial buildings, you have an ability to keep the site uh, the building as it is through dry flood proofing. Um, there are exemptions and variances. Uh, there are historic building exemptions. There is a floodplain variance process. Uh, I can tell you that since I've been floodplain manager for uh, and the CRS coordinator, uh, which has been about eight years now, the city has not approved any floodplain variances in the past decade. I don't know if they've actually approved a flood pl floodplain variance period. One of the reasons for that is that approving too many floodplain variances could imperil the city's standing with the National Flood Insurance Program. FEMA will look at it as we're not abiding by their rules. We are a member in their club that is the NFIP. And if we do too many workarounds, they will kick us out of the NFIP. So that's why we don't see too much of that out there. Uh, anyway, this is my brief discussion of the substantial improvement, substantial damage. Uh, I understand uh, Haggerty Consulting, our, our partners, uh, will be discussing, I think, part of this as well. In the meantime, I'll stand by for any questions now and later. Don't, don't go anywhere, Wyatt. All right. Okay, so an, an email that we have from our registered surveyor, Bill Nick, says that the finished floor elevation um, is at 7.83 feet and the finished floor elevation in this location with this floodplain would need to be 9.0. So this building is below finished flood elevation for uh, the floodplain, and we have improvements that would, would need to be made. Um, what options in, in your, uh, the three options would we, would we have in the building? Okay, so you could, uh, whether you, um, elevate the building or tear down and rebuild the building, it would have to be rebuilt at, 
uh, nine feet, uh, because base flood elevation for this area is eight, AE8, with Florida building code, you add plus one, nine feet. Uh, if you were to use the option to dry flood proof, basically you would um, make the repairs to the structure and you'd have to have those flood proof materials and the, the, the gates, the panels, up to 10 feet. So understanding a direction has been given to staff, but if we wanted to make the improvements to the building, if, if for whatever reason, we would have to not only incur the deferred maintenance cost of the 2.5 million, but then also flood proof the building because it's below finish the 9.0 elevation. We'd have to do that up to 10 feet. That would be the, through the dry flood proofing, that'd be correct, yes. Okay, so I just want you to understand what, what this means and what that, so we're looking at a building that is sitting less than eight at the floor elevation and we would have to flood proof that basically halfway uh, up the front door around the entire building. Okay, thank you Wyatt. Certainly. And that would be in a cost on top of the deferred maintenance that we already have that, that would be entering the permit. Council Member Cummings has got a question. Yeah, how much would that cost be? Um, I don't have an estimate. I don't, pub, has anybody from Public Works even, you know, in January we received the direction to move forward with the demolition uh, be, based on everything that was discussed. And so we, we have not even looked at trying to ascertain anything other than following the direction. But I, I'll, do you have any square foot estimates? 1.5 to 2, that's a rough number. Million. Uh, Damon Grant, for the record, 1.5 to 2 million, and that's just based on a square footage estimate of what we would add for uh, flood proofing up to 10 feet. That would be close to $4 million so far. Well, you're, that's if you're basing the $2.5 million off of numbers from last April. Our market today is that two and a half. There's no way. I don't believe that we can get that, that work done for 2.5. But if you just wanted to use that as a basis and add the, at the low end, you're still at 4 million. Not including inflation costs and. Council Member Cosden. Thank you, Mayor. I'm trying to get all this stuff straight um, and pardon my ignorance, but the variance, the floodplain variance, if that applied, then would we not have to do all those extra expenses that the city manager just talked about? If a variance was applied for and approved, and we do have variance conditions in our floodplain uh, ordinance, uh, they go to the hearing examiner. Uh, if it was approved, then that would be my understanding is that those improvement, uh, you would not have to then apply, uh, conform or be compliant with the floodplain regulations in that, in that case. Okay, so I just wanna point that out. That's not a done deal. Okay, thank you. Continue on, Mr. City Manager. And our, our last presentation is uh, from Haggerty. He's ready. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Bob Vanderwerf. I'm with Haggerty Consulting. Uh, my background is 20 years uh, working on the uh, FEMA Public Assistance Program, and uh, my background further is in the architecture engineering industry. Um, so this presentation is uh, correlated to the um, FEMA Public Assistance Funding um, that's directly related to uh, storm-related damage. Um, And in particular, this is gonna address the 50% uh, rule of it and uh, substantial damage. And this is the FEMA uh, definition of the 50% rule and substantial damage. Um, so FEMA's 50% rule is also known as uh, repair versus replacement. Um, for replacement, a, FEMA, uh, a facility may be eligible for replacement uh, when they compare 
the repair cost to the replacement cost, and it's more than 50%. Uh, the replacement cost is the cost of replacing the facility based on its pre-disaster design and function in accordance with the applicable building codes. The cost of replacing the facility is based on the new construction cost. That's kind of key for FEMA's calculation. They're going to be using the new construction cost for their 50% analysis. Um, on the other, and then on the other side of the coin is substantial damage. Um, substantial damage is met when the cost to repair a facility is 50% or more of its market value. Um, so again, the cost there is the market value. Um, the substantial damage determination is uh, determined by the jur jurisdiction's floodplain manager. Uh, unlike the 50% rule is uh, determined by FEMA. Um, the city and the floodplain plain manager can choose to submit their findings to FEMA for possible additional funding uh, to bring up the build building to uh, the floodplain requirements. So, um, What is the process? The FEMA process, um, we're kind of in the middle of right now for Hurricane Ian, is um, the site inspections. FEMA uh, wants to go out to the sites to uh, capture the damages, um, and so we're in the process of that right now. Then the next step, FEMA is going to write up the damages for each facility uh, item by item. And again, these are just storm-related damages. Uh, once they have that written up, they are going to submit the damages to the city to review and approve. Once the city approves the damages, they will start, FEMA will start creating the scope of work. Um, the scope of work is going to itemize how to repair each of the damages. At this time, uh, FEMA may calculate the 50% analysis. Uh, if a facility does not meet the 50% rule, uh, FEMA may then consider substantial damage claims. And so what is the possible timeline for all of this? Um, we are, again, waiting for FEMA to provide us with the damage description and dimensions for facilities they've already uh, inspected. Um, it can take a month. Right now, it's taking longer than a month uh, just for uh, the city to see the damages that, uh, that FEMA has written up. Uh, once the uh, damages are approved by the city, then FEMA will start working on the scope of work. Um, that can easily take from three to six months for when it includes the 50% analysis. Uh, the scope of work, when it's finished, will go back to the city for approval. Uh, once it's approved, there are still a couple more months before uh, funding uh, would be obligated to the city. And that's the basic uh, presentation. Council Member Hayden has a question. Yeah, we're starting to get into that confusing area now because when, okay. when we had the discussion at the retreat, we were, we were focused on hurricane damage only and how that applied to the 50% rule in substantive damage, okay? Okay. Is that what, and we know the 50% rule can apply to repairs that have to be made over a period of time and bringing it back to elevation. The report you just gave would be based on hurricane damage only to the Yacht Club? Correct, correct. Okay. It's her and, we, and we know um, that that's probably not going to exceed the 50% rule based on hurricane damage. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Now, you know, I don't know if it's part of your discussion to discuss the 50% rule the other way, unless that was what we just talked about. But uh, you know, I want to be really clear because in January, no one had really heard of the 50% rule before until after the hurricane, and that's when the discussion really started to pick up pace because that's what we were that's what we were talking about at the time. So it can get confusing to talk about over years of time the amount of damage that uh, uh, that had occurred be because of neglect or age or whatever it was 
but they're really two separate um, points of information here that we're, we're going after. So I just wanted to be clear as I read that uh, a couple days ago, um, it seemed to be back to what we were looking at earlier that, uh, you know, as FEMA does a report and whatever that damage is, that this is based on hurricane damage only. That, that is correct. I, I think it's also worth mentioning, though, that uh, the 50% of rule, it, it applies to substantial um, improvements of that structure as well. Uh, and I want to make sure that, you know, that's crystal clear as well, because to give you an example, you know, I've been in the construction industry for 36 years now, so I was very familiar with the 50% rule. I've had clients over the years here in Cape Coral call me, live in a 1970 house, uh, 1,500 square feet, and they want to put another 1,500 square foot addition on. Unfortunately, they wouldn't meet the 50% rule because their flood elevation was below where the uh, existing requirement was. So when you're talking about the 50% rule, I want to make sure it's crystal clear. It's just not applied to storm-related damage. It's for any improvements whatsoever to the structure. We already know that the building came back at $680,000 in value. So we know our window of opportunity is $340,000. Take the storm out of the equation. Last year, if we want to go down and put $2 million in that building or a million dollars in that building, we couldn't do it because of the 50% rule. So I just want to make sure that's perfectly understood. It's applied two different ways, not only with storm damage, but the substantial improvements that you're going to make on that particular structure. Mr. City Manager. I want to elaborate on that comment, but I would like to bridge the gap between what Council Member Hayden said and today. When we were discussing what we can do and what we should do and what the ultimate direction became in January, there was discussion about council about waiting to get FEMA's determination on the 50% substantial damage rule because if that was the case, we were given um, information that that would then trigger FEMA to actually fund the demolition. And so there was a substantial monetary value in obtaining that determination and having that inspection done. We didn't have to, we could have just went out and um, done whatever action we wanted absent that, that um, but there was an opportunity to have them come inspect, make a determination based on the amount of damage to the electrical room in the buildings, which then would then free up additional monies that we would, would not have to, uh, to bear ourselves. Now to, to um, fast forward to the, the mayor's comment. Um, in that regard, as was presented on, in Wyatt's slide, and I don't, I don't want a, anybody to accuse administration of, of not recognizing this, which is why we presented it um, today, and, and we've had discussions with uh, those of you, some of us were canceled uh, Monday, but there, slide seven does have exemptions and variances. So we've talked about the look back rule. It used to be five years when our staff looks at what uh, improvements need to be done to a structure or being proposed to a structure. We used to go back and look five years and value, take the total sum value of all those improvements as the mayor said in his example was a 1500 square foot on a 1500 square foot. Well, we used to have a five year look back where we would incrementally add the value of all those improvements to then compare it to the cost of the day the permit was being approved. We now have a one year look back. So if we were looking at reversing course, staff could break up that work in an effort to try to avoid having to comply with the, the floodplain, which is not, again, I'm not saying that's in the city's best interest, but I'm just presenting to you things that, that are options and exemptions and variances. We could try to pull a permit to do an HVAC upgrade and be less than the 340,000. We could try to get a roof permit the following year 
to get that outside of the 340,000. We could piecemeal this out for 20 years and have the same building and try to stay underneath that, that value. In addition, there is the historic exemption. We've, we've looked at that, we've examined that. Um, that's another way around it. And then there's the flood, the flood proofing, which we discuss with Wyatt based on the existing flood, flood plain. But in the totality of the entire park being basically destroyed, the construction we had coming forward, and the, and the amount of work done on the building, the decision was made not to renovate. The decision was to go in a different course of action, and that's the way staff is still proceeding. There are questions and comments that are coming in to me and my staff about are we going to try to restore, are we going to try to fix, clean, restore power. The answer to all of these questions is no. All of those is a direct contrarian position to what we've been di directed to do. And so I want to put all the media and all the questions that residents have, uh, you know, answer them all right now. We're moving forward with um, a different vision for the future. Now, in light of that, we've had discussions among staff about how to not forget the past. And so we've talked about ways of incorporating the beams that exist within, within the interior of the structure today into a new vision in the future. We've talked about how to save the fireplace and incorporate that into a new building and make a little sitting area or, or a place that can be enjoyed. We've talked about creating a, uh, videos and, and We've talked about having a, an auction to raise funds for uh, guardian angels and special pops and maybe the historical museum. We've talked about having the historical museum come in and get art relics and artifacts. Staff is recognizing that there is some value in this one structure at the park. And so we're looking for ways to continue to bring that past into the future, but to provide more flexibility and more functionality over the next 100 years, the next 60 years. Right now, as, as we dis was discussed in January, if, if 10 people want to come and rent the Yacht Club ballroom to play a poker game, those 10 people shut down the entire facility. If 400 wanted to rent it for a wedding, it's, it's the only thing that can happen. And what we talked about in January was providing a new building for the next 60 years that will service a population of near 500,000 that will have multiple um, viewing locations, multiple wings, multiple opportunities for multiple events uh, to go forward. When we come back, um, the plan at this point is to come back in August. What we've been discussing during our Hurricane Ian updates is to come back with a revision to the Kimley Horn pres uh, uh, contract that will include the specifications for how and, and when to remove the buildings that are on site and preserve what, whatever we want to preserve. And then in addition, start off a new vision session with the community on what are the elements, what are the amenities that we want looking out for the next 60 to 100 years for a doubling of population that doesn't even exist today. And that is the next step in the process that staff has um, coming before council um, in the next couple of months. The, for my perspective right now, I don't, I don't think there is any action that, that I'm requesting of council, but we, we needed to reset um, where the media and where certain members of the public were going with this. There was accusations of we're focused on 25,000. We there's misleading information. All of this information has been out there. All of this information, staff reviews substantial improvement every day, even when there isn't a hurricane, they have to do it. So if the hurricane never happened and we went to and any resident or any commercial building went to pull a permit, this exact review gets done, even though it's not a building of our own. But 
We don't have a waiver on ourselves just because we're a public entity. Staff has to go through the exact same uh, review. So with that, I'll open it up if there's any comments or discussions or, or thoughts, and uh, we'll go from there. Council Member Hayden. Mike, you're starting to take this conversation in a way that I'm not sure is completely accurate on what was discussed and what may have been, may or may not have been on our website as far as an itemized breakdown of what needed to be repaired. I'm not sure that's been up there since January. Um, obviously, the insurance claim hasn't been up there since January. Uh, m my point is the mindset of the conversation in January, as we talked about, I'm not sharing anything with the public that we didn't share. Yeah was completely different because all of council was focused on the hurricane. An entire retreat was focused on the hurricane and what was ahead of us moving forward. Um, at the time, um, I looked at it as, <clears throat> and I hadn't been out to the Yacht Club except to the Rotino Center since after the storm, um, was that uh, it was gonna suffer enough hurricane damage that it was gonna have to be demolished and repair. And those were my comments to the media. We have this great vision. We can improve the entire facility. Um, and I think the only way I varied from that now is, um, you know, you heard from the people earlier that it's our last remaining historic, iconic place in the city. It, it truly is. It's the oldest. It's the most well attended. And it's been that way since 19, 1962. Um, I think the vision of that property, excluding the ballroom, to uh, the Mice Rotino Center, look at our opportunities for possibly another restaurant, um, looking at uh, extending the, the uh, parking garage in a reverse L around where the tennis courts are, looking at branching off the current existing Yacht Club building and into smaller event space. Which, was op which I think was option number two um, that day, um, is more where I'm at now. Um, I'm certainly not in a place anymore where I think we need to demolish the building. I think we need to make all of the improvements. Um, I think we need to look at uh, the possibility of a variance or the flood proofing because the fact of the matter is we can probably still renovate the building for less than what it would cost to um, build a new one, even without the extensions on there. Look, <clears throat> I know I'm going to be in the minority up here, but I'm not sure there's anybody up here that's uh, done more research um, on the history of the Yacht Club than me or talked to all the residents that that was part of their life growing up. That was their heartbeat growing up. Um, and how much that meant to them to have this place. Hell, when the building first opened, it held every club that came into Cape Coral. The German American Club started there. All the church services that were first held were all held there before there was even a church up in the city. So the historical representation of a place that means so much to a community that's as young as we are, that's losing all of its historical markers, um, you know, it, it's important to me, and I think we need to do, look at every possible scenario that does not include demolishing the building um, as we move forward. You know, I love the rest of the plans for that space, for that complex, and what it'll mean for our community. Um, I'm even in favor of, you know, in order to do all the work, regard, regardless of where this outcome goes, the building's probably going to, or the complex, and the park is probably going to have to be closed for three or four years. And the residents are going to have to understand that if they want this jewel to return um, to what it was before in a meaningful way, in an important way for our community. Um, as far as bad information being shared, we haven't talked about this, you know, since the retreat until the last month or so. So, and as far as that being an important part of the conversation back at the retreat, we had a lot of priorities that day, those two days, to talk about. And I'm not sure where the Yacht Club fit into that then. It's a priority now and how we move forward. But, you know, after, um, and as far as it 
I know there's members of the community that are looking in to put it on the Federal Regist Historic Register. Um, but even that doesn't guarantee you that the building will be preserved. It clearly says in the application, this does not mean the building can't be demolished. But we should look at it, declaring it a historic, historic site. Our, our ordinance certainly doesn't do that. It talks about it being a historic resource, but not necessarily a, a historic building. So I know this is early on in the process and there's a lot more work to do, but I wanted to put it on the record because I had said earlier that, uh, you know, it seemed because of damage that may, may or may not have been caused by the hurricane at the time that this new plan seemed to make, say, make sense, but somehow how pre preserving the his historical integrity of the building. I think we can pre preserve the historic nature of the building without raising it, um, but moving on with uh, what I think are some pretty cool plans with the rest of the complex. Thanks. Thank you. I guess I'll jump in here real quick. Um, you know, when, when I take a, take a look at this, and even when we had the discussions back, uh, you know, during the retreat, uh, I knew that, you know, the substantial damage as a result of the hurricane was only one small component of this equation. What I looked at personally is, uh, like the city manager had mentioned, um, you know, when you take a look at this building, and we keep hearing this word historic, and over the last several weeks, I've heard that, that word come up. So I went and did some research to try to see what that meant at a state and federal level. So what I did is I went and I printed the uh, preservation, Historic Preservation Act of 1966 uh, at the federal level, and I read it page for page. And if you read that 1966 Act, that was implemented back then. And you see the criteria that you have to meet to be on the National Registry. The Yacht Club does not, does not meet the criteria. First, you have to also go through the uh, state preservation officer, get their approval first before you go to the National Register. But take all that out of the equation. You know, we have a building there that's 60 years old, um, and if you read the report like I did, and I'm sure most of you did, that showed that the building had a 40-year life expectancy, uh, and, and we're at 60 years now. At some point, you have to make a decision, uh, what is in the best interest for the future? And that's where I made my decision. I am planning for the next 60 years. Sure, can we put Band-Aids on it for the next uh, 20 years, like we have been? Um, and we can do that. We, we can manipulate the system, the FEMA system, and we can spend up to $340,000 each year for the next 20 years. But is that, is that what you're really looking for? And I think that's the question you have to ask yourself. Now, <clears throat> Council Member Hayden said he's talked to a lot of the residents, uh, you know, regarding this uh, uh, particular facility. And if you take a look at the residents um, that you're speaking of, or you look back in the 1960s to see how many residents we did have here back then, um, you know, it, it, it's a very small majority. And I can appreciate their personal emotional attachments to that structure. I base my decision on what is the best interest of the community moving forward for the next 60 years. And a lot of the decisions that we make as a council, we will never uh, experience them maybe during our tenure here sitting on the dais, but those decisions will uh, become uh, fruitful in the future. So my position really hasn't changed in the um, discussion that we had in January. Uh, staff has given a, been given a direction. I know they're moving in that direction. I think today we have to make sure that staff understands knowing what we know today. And some of that information has changed since January. But knowing what we know today, do we want staff to continue on the course 
that we had given them back in January. I think, if anything, today, we have to make sure that we give staff that direction because we surely don't want to keep going down this path and then this council makes a change or wants to go in a different direction. Let's let them know now. And I think that's uh, extremely important. I'm sure that's what staff is looking for today. So for me, my, my uh, decision hasn't changed. Um, I know we've gotten some additional information, uh, but I, feel, I still think it's in the best interest uh, to move forward, to build a new structure. Um, if we can incorporate some of the architectural features that are there now, uh, and it's not too costly, great. I'm okay with that. Um, but to try to, to just to put a Band-Aid on what we have uh, and try to keep it going for the next, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, to me, I don't think that's in the best decision uh, moving forward, so I wouldn't support that. So that's, that's where I'm at. Council Member Steinke. Thank you. Uh, I have had sleepless nights about this whole issue. Um, while I didn't move to the area until 1977, I swam in the pool as an infant. So I'm very familiar with, um, with the yacht club and the, and the ballroom. And so um, where, where we find ourselves and the vote that I have in this uh, is, is tough. One of the concerns that hasn't been um, spoken about, uh, and, and that is um, a byproduct of not complying with FEMA's rules, um, and if we toy around with the potential daisy chaining of a number of Band-Aids over a number of course of years, um, I don't think everyone is fully aware of the amount of discount that the NFIP gives our residents for their flood insurance premiums. And if we don't meet the requirements or we try to skate around the requirements, um, the NFIP can remove those credits from our municipality and all of the residents' uh, flood insurance premiums within it. So the decisions that we make and the decision that we're confronted with here can have a very vast impact other than just on the, the small community surrounding the Yacht Club. The other thing that I you know, would echo uh, Mayor Gunter is currently um, this facility um, should be serving five times more residents than it was originally designed to serve. Um, growth happens, and we have five times the families that would like to have weddings. We have five times the organizations that would like to have a place to meet. Um, we have five times, at least, uh, the number of companies would like to hold conferences and, and have a, a facility, a city facility, where this can happen. And within 15 to 20 years, as studies have shown, that five times amount is going to change to 10 times the amount. So given the opportunity that we are to um, look at um, maintaining the historical significance of the Yacht Club and the ballroom in question. Um, I would refer to um, Chapter 12 of 2020 Florida Building Code that specifically addresses historic buildings. And in Section 1202, it speaks to rehabilitation of historic buildings. And word for word, it says this, the act or process of making possible a compatible use of a property through repair, alterations, and additions while preserving those portions or features which convey its historical, cultural, or architectural values. 
And I don't think anything could describe the position we're in better than that. That through the proper design and respect for the historical significance of the design of that building as it was once built, as it was originally built. But to bring it up to current code standards, protect our citizens from any negative impact on their flood insurance policies, um, and open it up for a greater, a greater use for the citizens that we currently have and for the citizens that we will have would be a great contribution to our city. And so to think of a building that um, contains the elements that currently exist, but allows for multiple events, as was previously spoken of, um, that allows for additional use that currently couldn't be used, and to certainly avoid just you know, you, th you think of a compound fracture. Well, yeah, you can put a Band-Aid on it so it stops bleeding, but the bone is still broken. And what the study shows is that there's bones of this building that are broken. And before we put Band-Aids on, we need, to, we need to deal with the bones. And when I look at the assessment here, just the roofing component alone breaks the 50% rule. The walls that need to support the roof break the 50% rule. So we can try daisy chaining all the smaller ones as much as we want, but two of the major components, the walls themselves and the roofing, each of which break the 50% rule, is, is not in everybody's best interest. So um, I believe we need to do something different that will serve our current um, residency and that will be here to serve our future residency as well. Although, in accordance with, with Section 1202, I do believe we need to maintain um, and preserve those portions and features that convey its historical, cultural, and architectural values. Thank you. Councilmember Cummings. Well said, uh, both of you. Um, I, I know this has been a very a difficult topic for all of us. Um, this is not something that we're wanting to do because we want to do it. It's been very difficult because, uh, you know, a lot of people were born and raised here and was around the Yacht Club. But uh, Mayor and Councilman uh, Bill Stinky said it's, you guys said it very, very well. Um, I am for moving this forward. We don't have a choice. We have to put our feelings aside and, and look at this as a business. Like you stated, you can't put a Band-Aid on a wound when the bone is broken. Um, I am all about history. I, I am one of those, and I do feel like we have history here and some items that we can preserve. An idea that I have that we could do, you, uh, Mike Ilches and you kind of hit on it a little bit, is in the new building that's built, why can't we take a room and do a replica of the ballroom using the chandelier, using the fireplace, kind of giving that design in a smaller space of the new building. So you kind of still have that Yacht Club ballroom with the pieces in it, so you can walk in sit down, look at it, you know, look at the pictures on the wall of the Yacht Club of, of the 50 years. You have the fireplace, you have the chandelier, you have the ambiance that everyone remembers in one room. So that's an idea or a suggestion I would like to give. Are, are you suggesting in a new facility there would be like a, a miniature museum Yes. History of, of the site and the buildings as part of the new concept. Yes. Okay. That, that isn't something we've discussed, but I'll, we can add that to the list. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussions on this topic? Um, Council Member Welsh. Thank you. Do we currently have flood insurance on the Yacht Club? Yes. Yes. 
Is it required to have flood insurance? From my understanding, if you own a building, unless you hold a note on the building, you're not required to have flood insurance. But, well, any, anyways, for us to, what Council Member Steinke was talking about, about the, the flood insurance discounts, I think one building, if we were to have that exemption, isn't going to cause the National Flood Insurance Program to raise our rates um, if, we, if we choose to make that one exemption. I think the exemption is if we keep adding more and more and more buildings. I would like to look at what maybe the cost of that flood barrier would be um, and preserving the ballroom. I know back when we spoke about this in January, there was a lot, a lot going on for a lot of us uh, with hurricane and fixing and things like that. And it, it was my interpretation that the ballroom was beyond repair. Um, so I think going forward, I would like to look at it again now that we're kind of out of that um, disaster recovery phase and more of a, uh, you know, we can actually approach it with um, some different numbers. So I'm, I'm interested in entertaining that uh, exemption rule, what that's going to look like, and then what maybe the, I see on here what some of the costs are. So I wouldn't mind looking into that a little bit more and what it would be to fix. I'm also definitely for preserving certain elements of the building and then making a new building that um, fits the needs of the future. So I'm not trying to say I want to hold on to the past. I'm not trying to say I want to get rid of the past. I'd, I'd like to look at these things, but I do think that we need to make a decision um, on it because we, we have the time is now, you know, with the destruction we've had and um, and with the hurricane, now is the perfect time for us to, to make this decision and do it. But um, I'm not sure if that really helps out anything at all. But uh, like I said, knowing that we could put those flood barriers up, curious what that might look like, uh, what we could maybe do renovating the inside of the building to make it more functional than just one ballroom space, um, even if we were just to save that one building. Like we said, we know the Rotino Center doesn't serve the function that it should. We could still work some new things around it uh, or maybe build another another facility there to add more space. Um, but yeah, I, I, like I'm saying, I, I, I know the historical value of it and I I'm, I'm, would like to just see those different options. Thank you. Council Member Shepard, since you haven't spoken yet, I'll give you the floor. Um, I, I want to move forward with our past decision. Um, I don't want to re-speak everything that was said. I think all the facts came out, um, what the responsible move should be. Um, I know it's, it's, it's a tough decision for all of us. No one wants to uh, um, destroy the past or anything, but we have a responsibility to do what's right for all the citizens of Cape Coral. And even though there's a, a good amount of people that are, that are fighting to, to save the past, I, I can tell you that the majority of the people that reached out to me are excited about a new yacht club, you know, something new and modern that um, you know, makes it possible for more of the citizens of Cape Coral to enjoy that that location, um, you know. So that that's where I stand. Um, you know, there was a lot of people in the past passionate about the original concession stand that was there years ago. People had memories. I was one of them. I, all my kids growing up here in Cape Coral used to go to that concession stand and. And there was uh, a lot of people back then that didn't want to see the concession stand removed for the, for the new uh, restaurant that's there now. I mean, it was the same kind of situation, but what do we do? We, we improved the service and where people can enjoy that location. And I think that's the responsibility of council. It's not just the responsibility of making it an asset for all the citizens of Cape Coral, but safety as well. Um, you know, the, the building wasn't designed to withstand, uh, you know, the storms. And it could be a liability in the future if we band-aid it. 
Um, I don't want to be the one to tell somebody in the future, uh, sorry about what happened, because we, we decided not to, uh, you know, uh, fix the liability that was there. So it's a tough one, and, uh, but I want to move forward on our past decision. I don't think it needs to be rethinked. I'm glad that the city manager uh, brought this forward today to put all the facts out there to stop all the misinformation. Um, there isn't, a, there isn't a, a group of people that want to destroy the Yacht Club or that's their intention or, you know, uh, we're just following the, the right process to come up with the right answer. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Kyleston. Then I'll go to you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, like many people, I have fond memories of the Yacht Club. I remember I took swim lessons there as a little tiny toddler. So it does have a nostalgic place in my heart. Um, and I get the struggle. But, and this is not just about the hurricane. Um, I think the city manager made it clear that this is, this is not about hurricane damages. That seems to be the message people got. And I don't know how that happened. But um, that's not what this is about. We all knew up here before the storm that we needed to do something with the Yacht Club, something serious. Um, we're here up here to look after the city, the health of the city, not just the quality of life health, but also the financial health. Um, and so as we make this decision, I think it's important that we consider those two factors. Um, to me right now, I, I don't have everything I need. I want more information I've requested and I'm taking a tour tomorrow actually of the facility. Um, but to me right now, it makes sense to move forward with the plan. Um, Two and a half million dollars in repairs versus 3.2 million to reconstruct. And then not too much more than that to just build a new building that incorporates all the historic elements of this building. It just seems to make financial sense. And I could be wrong. I could be missing something. And so I'm happy to listen. I have my listening ears on. But um, again, pending more information later this week, that's where I stand. Thank you. Council Member Hayden. <coughs> probably inevitable at this point where, uh, where we're going to end up. Um, but just two points of clarification. Um, a, a major renovation project is hardly a Band-Aid. Um, we know it needs new plumbing, it needs new air conditioning, it needs a new roof, new windows, new, new walls inside. But I think, <clears throat> I think it's worth it for uh, not only the value of its history, but what people have gotten accustomed to looking at when they go out there. That building, I think, meant something, not just to the people in the 60s, but those in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I would hope there would always be reminders, too. I think when people move here, um, all the different generations would like to, like to know a little bit about what this city is about. You know, we're a young city. We're going to continue to grow. We're going to have so many more great amenities coming in here. But per preserving... Um, that that history, that uh, timeline of amazing moments that have occurred at different buildings, life-changing moments for a lot of people in this town, for a lot of different generations in this town. You know, we are to the point now where we have buildings, not many left now, that are over 50, that are over 50 years old. You know, and, and that establishes some um, historical chronology about what your city is about. You know, if this moves forward the way it appears, it's, it's going to move, even though I'm against it. Um, and I talked about this before. We have to find ways to incorporate the history of that yacht club inside a new building that may or may not be built. And Council, Council Member Cummings, I had already mentioned a long time ago that we need a small museum out there that depicts... Um, uh, what the Yacht Club was and what it was about, so people can have a little bit of an understanding um, um, of, of what it is. Um, as we move forward, as I guess what's, was going to be the original plan, unfortunately, you know, we, we still have to have the discussions about what will be in, you know, we looked at the design, you know, we haven't really talked a whole lot since then about how long it will be closed and residents are going to have to understand you know this is a this is a major project that can't be done in piecemeal um, 
and that's going to impact how people use the beach um, and what 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 is out there. So you know, the next discussions will have to be set up by you now as we move forward. And you know, you establishing a timeline on what we do next um, is great, but. Uh, um, Kind of knew how this conversation today was going to play out, but uh, you know it was important for me to share my feelings now, um, four or five months later since the original discussion about um, what the yacht club means to me, what it means to the community, and uh, and uh, preserving its historical significance. Mr. Mayor, what I'm going to do is work with um, Paul Klingen, who's um leading up the amendment to the Kinley Horn contract to develop a timeline that will include um, the reopening of, of the beach, the reopening of, of any amenities that, that may be able to be uh, opened prior to. Um, we also need to work with risk because as you all know, um, and some of you are still going out there, um, it is an active construction site uh, so we have um, vessel recovery happening there and boat crushing. We have uh, contractors re repairing all the channel markers in the county. Um, there is no um, electric at the site. There is no restrooms. There are no restrooms at the site. Um, various trees and landscaping is still down. The boathouse is still repairing the boathouse. And... Um, the fuel docks and fuel pumps are still being worked on. Uh, and several of the other buildings, the beach house and the harbor master building are still in a, uh, basically a, a destroyed condition. So um, the site is still closed to the general public. Um, we are taking members of council so that you can have a uh, firsthand feel and look uh, at what is happening down there and what the existing condition is. But as we move forward with uh, the restoration of the property, um, we're going to have to be methodical about how that is going to work, be mindful of, of the risks that are involved, and uh, we'll, we'll begin to put together a, a path forward, a, a plan uh, that kind of lays that out, and we'll, we'll bring that back for discussion to, to make sure everybody is comfortable before uh, we start taking those steps. I'm not going to make these decisions in a, in a vacuum. Uh, we're we're going to have to do this together. Yeah, I'm going to say one thing also, and then I'll give you the opportunity. The, <clears throat> for me, you know, this is going to be a, this is going to be a process. Um, this is going to take some time. We're not going to do this overnight. We're not going to do it in the next year or two years. One thing that uh, I would like to see us try to do, first off, um, I was never uh, a supporter of, shutting down the whole entire park during the construction of this, uh, whatever we do. Uh, I think easily we can divide this park in half where we can, as we all know, hopefully uh, probably by the end of June, first part of July, I think the boathouse will be ready uh, to be open. I've spoken to the owner many times. I know that they have recently got, gotten all their permits uh, that they needed to get, uh, and I was told probably about 30 days to complete the repairs uh, that they needed to, be, to uh, complete. So I think here in the next 30 to 45 days, they'll be ready to open. So we are going to have to make some improvements of that area between now and then uh, to, to have safe passage uh, to that business. Additionally, um, in the short term, and I know that at some point in time we will have to shut it down again, uh, I would like to see us take the steps, necessary steps, uh, to get the beach open. I think that, uh, you know, we can, we can do the appropriate cleaning of that area uh, to make sure it's safe. I know we ha probably have to do some sonaring out in the waterways uh, where the swimmers are allowed. Uh, probably should do some sonaring around the, uh, uh, the old pier area uh, to make sure there's no debris under the water. Uh, that, that we're not aware of, make sure, uh, you know, we get that cleaned up. Uh, also, I'd ask the city manager, you know, we have those two particular firms uh, that uh, we basically uh, uh, gave a priority use agreement to uh, for that particular area. We entered into that agreement. 
uh, March 30th, if I recall correctly, and it goes to the end of August, so we have another 90 days there. Uh, what I would like to see in the next 90 days, knowing that those two entities are there, um, I wouldn't recommend, uh, because there is an, a clause that you could extend the contract, I wouldn't support that. Most of the work that's being done uh, at that uh, location now by those two firms are, except for maybe some sunken boats that we still are raising and, and bringing there, but for the most part, all of the work in Cape Coral is completed. Uh, so I wouldn't support uh, continuing that contract. And that gives us the next 90 days to hopefully put a plan in place and get the cleanup needed to at least get the beach open uh, by the end of that time. I don't know if that's a aggressive timeline, but that would be my personal desire because we'll have the boathouse open, get the beach all, uh, open. I think we could cord put a fence up, you know, where the northern half of the park is still closed because even when we start this construction, once we get our permits for the Army Corps and FDEP, I think the first uh, bit of work that's going to be completed uh, is going to be the seawalls and the dock area and all that's mainly in the north and getting the new ramps in. So most of that works on the northern part of the, of the uh, and that's probably just that in itself is probably going to be at least 18 months to get that completed once you even start. Um, so I think there's going to be that timeline development that, that we talked about that hopefully we can, we can look at. Uh, but in the short term, I think uh, it's important to try to get that beach open. I'd like to get that open as soon as possible. So I just thought I would, uh, I would mention that uh, to you as well. I see a lot of people shaking their heads, so hopefully uh, that, that's a... Uh, you know, that's a priority that, that we have as a council collectively. Uh, council Member Cummings. Um, you pretty much answered one of my questions was about the beach, so thank you for going over that. And, um, and Tom, uh, Councilman uh, Hayden, when I meant replica, not creating the museum, a replica of the, the ballroom that could be utilized by the public to run it out, smaller conference room, but the replica of the Yacht Club. I just wanted to uh, re kind of confirm what I was sharing with my um, vision to keep that feel of the Yacht Club. I, I understand what you were saying. And, I, and when we had a walkthrough with Council uh, Member Hayden, he had talked about designating a room. I don't know if we, the replica was more of what I was saying was unique. I think what we spoke about was creating a room that would have uh, basically a history of it and all the uses. So. Uh, I, I think your idea maybe took his idea and just kind of like recreated the room in the space is what I was seeing. So I, I did see them as different, but I do know. Okay, got it. So you still keep that yacht club room, that feel of the ballroom. So that's what I was saying, utilize it. But I know, I know it's hard, so. And thank you for covering the beach. That's yep. great, thanks. Thank you. All right, I don't see any other comments or any lights on. Uh, so I think, uh, Mr. City Manager, unless you got something else, we'll move on to item five. Okay. All right. Item five is a roundtable uh, discussion. I only had one item uh, that I wanted to bring up, and I know the City Manager has one as well. Um, as we all know, uh, you know, we'll be interviewing for a new city attorney. And as a part of that process, uh, like we did with the uh, previous uh, city manager, we not only had private interviews one-on-one, -on -one, we also had a public um, interview as well. Once we narrowed down the candidates, we wanted to, to uh, get to that point. I think um, once we have that public uh, interview on the 14th, uh, which is scheduled now for uh, June 14th, we have a, we have a meeting, a, a regular council meeting on the 14th at 4.30 p.m. Uh, very similar to, I think we did uh, before. Uh, I was hoping, uh, and I think it would be beneficial and probably less disruptive if maybe we had a two o'clock special meeting uh, that particular day just on the city attorney uh, interviews and, and discussion uh, versus having it in a regular council meeting. Uh, I just wanted to find out uh, 
uh, the thoughts of, of my colleagues here to see if that's a direction that you uh, agree to go in. Everybody? I wouldn't be able to attend at, at, at this point. I'm already scheduled there. I could look at, at doing some rescheduling, but at the very moment, I couldn't make it at 2 o'clock on that day. Okay. Because I'm thinking if we had three interviews and, and we give them, I'm thinking maybe a total of hour and hour and 15 minutes discussion, what do you, what is that? No, no. If 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 we uh, if we have thirty minutes for each individual, and then and then have a discussion, that's an hour and a half. So, you know, that's why I said two o'clock. You know, because our meeting our regular meeting starts at four thirty. So, I have a question. Um, do we have enough? I didn't even look. Do we have enough applicants? Are we just going to settle for well what applied so far? I mean, this is a very important position. Well, there's three uh, candidates as of now with a possible fourth when we had this discussion there's no saying that we have to pick from those individuals if collectively as a council we say nah, we want to go back out we won't know that until we have those interviews gotcha. I didn't but, know so we I have that opportunity I didn't know or that. if a majority decides hey we got a pretty good candidate here um, let's move forward collectively we'll make that decision so I, I think still everything's on the table. It's not that these three individuals and it's either this or nothing. I don't think that's the case. Um, Council Member Steinke, I see. Uh, so let's go back before I give him the uh, floor. Everybody's okay with two o'clock. You just got to figure out if you can arrange your schedule. Okay. What was that date again? The 14th. It, that's our last meeting day before a hiatus. We have a regular council meeting at uh, 4.30 that day. So I figured we would do that at 2. Everybody okay with that? Except for council member Steinke's a maybe. Okay. All righty. And I see your light on there, uh, council member uh, Steinke, so I'll give you the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, um, bring up a, a past uh, decision, and that was as it relates uh, to the existence or non-existence of the BRC. Uh, we looked at, uh, originally, we started off with a, do we need to evaluate and make some changes, uh, which I was uh, fully in, in favor of, uh, although I wasn't in favor, uh, based on my vote, uh, to totally eliminate it. So um, I'd like to take the responsibility of putting together uh, a, an amended resolution that would address those things that we did want to change short of total elimination. Uh, and I'd, I'd like the support to uh, work with staff and take the responsibility to put together re a, a, an amended resolution where we, where we would address those things uh, that, that we would like to see uh, uh, clarified in the resolution. The intent of the committee the responsibility of the committee, the purview and scope of the committee, and and the meeting expectations uh, of that of that committee, and so I'm I'm looking for support uh, to do that to bring that back uh, to the council uh, for a vote. I'll be the it's, second. Well, my first question is to the city attorney. Yeah, I, uh, this is a cow meeting and not a voting meeting, so I don't know if we I, can give seconds. I don't. I, you you can't because it's not a voting meeting. I mean, you can get. You, you always do consensus, so. It's not a second for real. It's a, you're, you're allowed to do it. It's not a, I'm seconding your vote for the motion. Correct. I okay. know there's no, I know there's no vote. That's what I'm. So getting. should I just be looking it's, for consensus, consensus of whether that's of whether an effort that like forward. would likely that's be undertaken? That's the same language we used. I am not going to change that language <laughs> now. <laughs> okay. We've always gone forth with a consensus. So I'm so looking for consensus. At a cow meeting. So. I, I'm looking oh. uh, for so consensus. So what's the definition of consensus? I'm, I, <laughs> Let's go ahead and get the people <laughs> nodding their head. Is that, is yeah. that okay? Yeah. By a majority. Yeah. By by a majority. Well. Five out of ten. By one because. Okay. Your rules state all you need is a second. Okay. All, all right. right. So it sounds like Council Member Cosden is given the consensus, given the consensus. Yeah. to yeah. move forward. Yeah. So as long as you're okay with that? I'm okay with that. Well, and just, just to throw a quick another layer on there, since it is but just by consensus, and it was a 4-4 tie, there wouldn't be a prevailing side or a non-prevailing side 
on this and because it's a resolution, none of that would factor into it, right? It's a whole new resolution. It doesn't matter. If, if you make one, resolution. you have to be on the other side, but because the vote was 4-4. I don't think he's asking for a no. reconsideration. Yeah, but but that was to to go ahead and the, the 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 resolution that was on for a vote was was to repeal. This is not to repeal anything. This isn't a reconsideration of that particular resolution, because he's going to bring the council member is going to bring forth another resolution right. that amends, doesn't repeal, it amends the current resolution. <laughs> All right. Any other roundtable items? Mr. City Manager, I know you got one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to confirm the uh, location for our summer retreat. Um, was currently planned to be um, June 15th and June 16th, so this would be the day after uh, the Wednesday, June 14th. Uh, we are looking to cancel the 16th. Uh, we can wrap up everything that we have to present on the 15th. And the location is uh, planned at the Mercola Market. So I just want to confirm location um, and and also get consensus to cancel the the, re the second day on the 16th. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Item six: time and place of future meetings. We have a special meeting, which is an attorney-client session at the Cape Coral City Council. Was scheduled for today. May 31st, 2023, beginning at uh, 1 p.m. I would like to change that to 2.30. That would give us time to take a break and have lunch. Uh, and uh, that meeting will be here in council chambers again, 2.30 today. And uh, we have a regular meeting at the Cape Coral City Council. It's scheduled for Wednesday, June the 7th, 2023, beginning at 9 a.m. here in council chambers. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Meeting adjourned.